Good evening to you all. I'd like to call our meeting to order. I'd like to welcome you all to the Monday, May 22nd, 2017 meeting of the Falls Church City Council. We are delighted you all are with us this evening and I would like to ask you to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Madam Clerk, will you call roll, please? Yes, sir. Ms. Conley? Here. Mr. Duncan? Here. Ms. Hardy? Here. Ms. Oliver? Here. Mr. Snyder? Here. Mr. Z? Here. Mayor Tarter? Here. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Do we have a motion to adopt the meeting agenda? I move to adopt the meeting agenda as amended. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The ayes have it. We have a very busy evening this, uh, this evening, particularly as it relates to proclamations and recognition, but it's a pleasure to have you all with us this evening. Um, the first item that I'd like to call is Operation Earth Watch in the recognition of our student, uh, students who are participating in that. I think Kate Walker, are you gonna be handling that? So, um I'd like to invite everyone who's involved with Earthwatch to join me up front here, please. Operation Earthwatch is the city's own homegrown environmental action program. You know, the city manager was talking about how the things that happen here are things that were somebody's idea and they said, let's get together and do it. And that's what Operation Earthwatch is. So it's an action program for elementary school children now in its 24th year in the city shows our youngest community members how they can protect the environment in the city and in the world. The program is still organized by volunteers. It's led by an Environmental Sustainability Council member who unfortunately can't be with us, Sarah beeman Bailden, and assisted by uh, Susan Matchett at Mount Daniel and Laurel Ruland at St. James. This year we had 140 participants who completed all six months of the program. So if you think how many kids did maybe three or four, that's a lot of participants in the program. Obviously, I couldn't invite them all, um, but I have invited Sophia De Rosa. Sophia? Sophia created this year's T-shirt design. Sweet, I love it. Yeah. And also with us is Alana Peterson, who did the wonderful sun symbol on the poster. Ooh, I like it, Alana, great job. Uh, seven very dedicated students completed Operation Earth Watching every year of their kindergarten and elementary school career this year, including Alex Jerez, is she here? Alex Jerez, uh, Sebastian Groh, Lee Barch, Madison Servanak, Rhea Rajiv, Madeline Adlana, and Remy Ostriker. Their names have been added to the plaque, which will hang on the wall of their schools. Um, Operation Earthwatch is sponsored by city organizations and businesses, including Art and Frame, Bike Netic, Mike Steli, Don Bayer Volvo, Falls Church Foot and Ankle Center, sorry to gabble, I know we're short of time, Falls Church Garden Club, Falls Church Vipas, uh, Family Medicine in Falls Church, the Falls Church Annandale Lions Club, the O'Hara Law Firm, Point of View Eyewear, and Rotary Club of Falls Church. And when I mention Falls Church um, Lions Club, all of our sponsors, including uh, Tom here from Art and Frame, contribute to the purchase of t-shirts for our six-month participants. But the Lions Club also fund the planks, and here's Don Farrow to tell you why. Don, uh, could you come to the Lions Club and Annandale. We just merged with Annandale. Um, when I was a new lion in the club back in 93, uh, the club jumped on the opportunity to sponsor Operation Earthwatch. Uh, our kids were involved already with environmental activities in the school. Uh, Annette Mills' name comes to mind. And that experience of being in touch with their world around them, the natural world around them, gave my children infant understanding of what they, their organic elements are around them. And it's enabled them to stay with their adult minds. They were more ready to be involved in global thinking and 
all the caring for our community. Of course, Lions Club is all about community service, and so I stuck with my club, and my two daughters uh, actually joined the National Science Foundation and Nature Conservancy, continuing to be involved in conserving the environment. Thank you so much. Why, why don't we get anyone involved in uh, Operation Earthwatch to come forward and we can get a group photo. How's that sound? You guys want to come up? Think about it. All right, come on up. All right, let's move on to our next item, which is appointment and recognition of student representatives. Uh, that's coming up right now from Mr. S uh, Mr. Z. Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I move to appoint the recommended slate of students as youth board and commission representatives and recognize youth representatives appointed to civic organizations. Now, how we're gonna do this is uh, uh, Mary Beth is gonna call your name and uh, we'd like you to come up as your name's called I'm going to give you one of these little pins. Mary Beth is going to give you your certificate. And uh, you just you stand up here at the end, and, uh, and uh, we'll just uh, have the Second. usual photo op. Got that? Great. Okay. Mary Beth? I'm going to read each name. Right. Go ahead, Miss. I, did, I didn't hear a second for the motion. That's all I have. Oh. We may need to think about this. I've uh, been anyway. I'm kidding. We're, uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and have a second. I have a motion. I didn't hear a second. Second the motion. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? All right. Congratulations. Thank you, Council. Okay. Julie Connolly for the Historical Architectural Review Board. at the end there. Katie Deal, the Environmental Sustainability Council. <laughs> Evelyn DeRoss, the Environmental Sustainability Council. Niharika Singhvi, Environmental Sustainability Council. James Gogol, Recreation and Parks Advisory Board. Sonia Liu, <laughs> Recreation and Parks Advisory Board. Zachary Holmes for the Environmental Sustainability Council. All right, Taika Wallace for the 
Library Board of Trustees, Tahasin Sheikh for the Human Services Advisory Council, Jesse Beto, the Falls Church Education Foundation, Kira Curtin, the Falls Church Education Foundation, Acacia Wyckoff, the Falls Church Democratic Party, right. and Selwyn Hemingway, the Village Preservation and Improvement Society. And after we do a photo, we'll do your oath of office like we do for all of our board members. So if you guys want to stay there, just stay there. So I just need you to raise your right hand and just answer my question. <laughs> Do you solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia and that you will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent upon you as a member of your board according to the best of your ability, so help you God? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And one person, Tahasin, Tahasin, come up. We have one more person who just arrived. Yes. Do you solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia and that you will faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent upon you as a member of your board according to the best of your ability, so help you God. Congratulations to you all. We look forward to your service and some great ideas. So thank you all for coming out. We look forward to seeing more of you all. Our next proclamation is declaring May 21st through 27th as Volunteer Appreciation Week. Mr. Snyder, would you like to do the honors? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, before I do, I think this evening in the City Council meeting and earlier, we had a very clear demonstration of the importance of volunteers to every aspect of the city. Everything from emergency services to parks, human services, environmental issues, voters, arts, library, on and on and on. Volunteers are what really make this city. So while we're called the little city and we're called the tree city, I think in many ways we ought to be called the volunteer city as well. So thank you again. So this is a proclamation that uh, formally uh, recognizes uh, the um, extent uh, to which our volunteers really make um, our city what it is in the past, in the present, and in the future will make it a great place to be. So the proclamation goes as follows. Whereas volunteerism empowers individuals to find their purpose and turn their passion into meaningful change, and whereas people of all ages can volunteer and through the smallest of acts, anyone can do their part to improve the lives of others. And whereas the creation of the City of Falls Church was initiated by a volunteer group of citizens. And whereas the City of Falls Church is fortunate, fortunate to have a citizenry that is dedicated to community involvement through church, civic, humanitarian, scouting, business, and government volunteer service. And whereas these individuals are motivated to service for the greater good of the City of Falls Church and humankind. And whereas when citizens volunteer for citywide cleanups to remove invasive plants and parks, to plant street trees or to educate the public about energy efficiency and sustainability, they shape a brighter future for the city. And whereas when volunteers fan out in the city devoted to causes bigger than themselves, like youth mentoring, helping abused or homeless individuals to recover and become self-sufficient, providing scholarships and grants for students, and providing humanitarian aid inside and outside the city's borders, the good reputation of the City of Falls Church grows. 
And whereas Falls Church is a much more vibrant place because volunteers have worked to promote the arts, provide enrichment programs for school children, support youth sports programs, and to support local businesses to increase economic development. And whereas city residents take great pride in their active involvement with local government and serve on 23 city boards and commissions and 11 regional commissions. And whereas there would be no community without volunteers to add the human component to local government by raising their voices, lending a hand, and providing comfort and cheer to fellow citizens. And whereas the City of Falls Church offers its thanks and gratitude to each of its hundreds of volunteers by declaring a week of appreciation. Now, therefore, I, David Tarter, Mayor of the City of Falls Church, Virginia, do hereby proclaim May 21st through 27th 2017 as Volunteer Appreciation Week in the City of Falls Church and offer the heartfelt thanks of the City Council to each member of the Falls Church community who volunteers their time to serve others. Is there anyone uh, coming up to receive this recognition, Mr. Shields? I know we, we had a very nice reception just a few minutes ago downstairs, but if there are folks here from that reception or a volunteer, we'd love to get a photo, a group photo maybe in front of the dais. So Everyone. I see plenty of volunteers out there. Why don't you all come Everyone. forward come on and we can get a, great, get a great group photo. Stay here, you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jeff, thanks so much. All right, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Sorry, we won't reach you over there. Okay. Maybe do two rows. Two rows. Scrunch in, you guys. Come in, come in, guys. Double up here, guys. This way. Yeah. All right. He's gonna get the whole. You're gonna have to get him scrunch in. You won't be in the picture. Oh, she's trying to do it. Okay. She's taking it from the back. She's. Oh, she knows. She wants you to hang on to that. Proclamation. Our heartfelt thanks go out to all of you. Thank you so much. Our next proclamation uh, is regarding Public Works Week here in Falls Church. And Mr. Duncan will be doing the honors. Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Proclamation, whereas the essential services provided to the community by the city's Department of Public Works are an integral part of citizens' everyday lives and Whereas the Department of Public Works manages and provides a wide range of systems, programs, projects, and services, including streets and sidewalks, traffic signals, stormwater management, sewers, environmental services, signage, public buildings, fleet maintenance, urban forestry, and green spaces, snow removal, leaf collection, recycling, and solid waste collection. And whereas Public Works staff provide expertise in engineering, geospatial information systems, grants administration, procurement, contracts, construction management, and maintenance of the city's capital improvements program. And whereas the efficiency and effectiveness of these Public Works services are dependent upon the dedicated efforts of Public Works employees who have adopted as the vision statement, quote, working together to sustain and enhance our community's infrastructure and provide a safe, green, and clean environment, end quote, and whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is of vital importance to sustaining the city's infrastructure and encouraging those responsible for that infrastructure, 
And whereas the year 2017 marks the 57th annual National Public Works Week, sponsored by the American Public Works Association, and whereas this year's theme for National Public Works Week is Public Works Connects Us and speaks to the essential and interconnected nature of public works in support of everyday quality of life. Now, therefore, I, David Tarter, mayor of the city of Falls Church, Virginia, do hereby proclaim the week of May 21st through 27th, 2017 as Public Works Week in the city of Falls Church and urge citizens to join in recognizing the significant daily contributions of the Department of Public Works staff. I'd like to welcome and invite the uh, Public Works staff to come forward, the whole group if we can, to come forward and get recognized. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council. Uh, this is just some of us. There's 44 or so. <laughs> and we, we do a lot of different things in the city, obviously. And so as you can tell, we tried to uh, at least come out in a little bit of a force tonight. And so what we, we really wanted to do, and, and I never read the script that I always prepare. I'm sorry, I'm always shooting from the hip. But this is a great team effort. All of public work seems to do wonderful things. We always try to find solutions to some of the complicated problems that we always encounter, especially with some of the aging infrastructure and things that we deal with every day. And so this is a great opportunity, I think, uh, for the education of not just what Public Works does, but for the community itself. And the community can see us out there every day. We work every day and you know, we try to serve every citizen out there so that w they can understand that whatever tax dollars that they pay, those go to a very good cause. And so, of course, see us out there, wave at us, and we'll certainly wave back. So thank you very much for this proclamation. Thank you so much. Why don't you come forward? And we'll get a group photo here. I like the back of your poster. <laughs> Jimmy Valley? On the, On the back. back side. Oh, yes. <laughs> that's what we call recycling. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Uh, I tell you, you, you're the unsung heroes of Falls Church. Day in and day out, you're out there. Rain, snow, sleet, whatever else is out there. So but we really do appreciate it. So thank you again. Our next proclamation is relating to Gun Violence Awareness Day. And Ms. Hardy is going to do the honors. Great. Ms. Hardy? Thank you. Whereas more than 90 Americans are killed every day by gun violence and countless others are injured, and whereas protecting public safety is the local government's highest responsibility, and whereas to honor those lives cut short by shootings and those who are injured, a national coalition of organizations has designated June 2nd, 2017 as the third annual National Gun Violence Awareness Day. And whereas the friends of Hadia Pendleton, a teenager shot and killed soon after marching in the 2013 presidential inaugural parade, asked classmates to commemorate her life by wearing orange on her June 2nd birthday because the color orange is worn by hunters for safety and also symbolizes the value of human life. And whereas anyone can help raise awareness about gun violence by pledging to wear orange on June 2nd, and whereas Falls Church is committed to reducing gun violence, keeping firearms out of the wrong hands, and encouraging gun owners to practice safe and responsible gun ownership. Now, therefore, I, David Tarter, Mayor of the City of Falls Church, Virginia, do hereby proclaim, pro proclaim June 2nd, 2017 as 
gun, awareness, gun Violence Awareness Day in the city of Falls Church and urge citizens to wear orange on June 2nd to help raise awareness about gun violence. Okay, do we have some folks who'd like to come forward? We'd love to hear from you. Welcome and thank you for your great work you're doing. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm Michelle Sandler with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. I um, run the McLean Falls Church group and we started about a year and a half ago and have grown leaps and bounds. And, uh, but most of all, we just wanted to thank you. Really, I say all the time that Falls Church is really the gold standard when it comes to supporting our efforts. And we just want to thank you so much for um, everything that you do to help us with this uh, work that we have to do. Not all cities and towns are supportive the way that you are. And so we want to thank you. And we're here to show our support, and um, thank you for everything you do. We have some events going on in the area uh, we're working on right now on June 2nd, having um, some placement of balloons in the area to bring awareness, and uh, in Alexandria, our whole entire Moms Demand Action will have a big rally um, to support uh, this effort, and um, we'll have uh, the Gay Men's Chorus there as, along with uh, Lieutenant Governor Ralph Northam. So we invite in the whole entire Northern Virginia area to that rally to, to bring uh, awareness to this issue. So thank you. Thank you. Why don't you come forward for a photo? I'd like to give you, give you our congratulations and thanks as well. Our next proclamation uh, commemorates the 275th anniversary of the founding of Fairfax County, our neighbor. And who's going to be handling that? Miss Oliver. Hmm. Whereas our neighbor, Fairfax County, is celebrating the 275th anniversary of its founding and the county's roots reach back to the earliest days of the nation. And whereas two of the greatest leaders in our nation's cause of freedom made their homes in Fairfax County, George Washington of Mount Vernon and George Mason of Gunston Hall. And whereas Fairfax County was formed in 1742 from the northern portion of Prince William County, and at the time it included all of present-day Loudoun and Arlington counties and the cities of Alexandria, Falls Church, and Fairfax. And whereas the town of Falls Church was incorporated in 1875 within the boundaries of Fairfax County, and the history of the city and county are forever intertwined. And whereas the city of Falls Church and Fairfax County have found many occasions to work together to serve the mutual interest of their citizens. And whereas the economic fortunes of Falls Church are linked to and influenced by Fairfax County, which is home to many Fortune 500 companies and two of the largest business districts in the United States, Tyson's Corner and Reston. And whereas the county government and its citizens acting together have built excellent schools, a wonderful library system, an expansive park system, have maintained a low crime rate and a high quality of life, and have promoted equal opportunity and inclusiveness in county programs. 
and for these and many other achievements, Fairfax County has been recognized as the best managed county in the nation. And whereas the citizens of Fairfax County are right, rightfully proud of their tradition of positive leadership in our region, our Commonwealth and our nation, and whereas the city of Falls Church looks forward to many years of collaboration with our neighbor Fairfax County. Now, therefore, I, David Tarter, mayor of the city of Falls Church, Virginia, do hereby commend and congratulate Fairfax County on the occasion of the 275th anniversary of its founding and issue this proclamation as an expression of the city of Falls Church's councils appreciation for Fairfax County's illustrious history and bright prospects. Is anyone here from the county? Okay, well, why don't we make sure this gets to uh, Sharon Villava and the rest of the county uh, board of supervisors. Thank you very much. Okay, our next proclamation and last proclamation, I would add, uh, regards the Chesapeake Bay Awareness Week. And Mr. Z is gonna do the honors. Thank you, Mayor. Whereas the Chesapeake Bay is the largest and at one time the most productive estuary of the United States spanning six states and the District of Columbia and, whereas the Chesapeake Bay watershed is an extraordinary and vital natural resource as well as an integral part of the history and heritage of the Commonwealth, and whereas the Chesapeake Bay is fed by 50 major tributaries, including the Susquehanna, Potomac, Rappahannock, York, and James Rivers, and contains more than 15 trillion gallons of water. And whereas the Chesapeake Bay stretches 200 miles from Have to Grace, Maryland, to Norfolk, Norfolk, Virginia, has an average depth of 21 feet, and ranges from 3.4 to 35 miles wide, and supports 340 species of fin fish, 173 species of shellfish, and more than 3,600 species of plant and animal life, including 2,700 types of plants and more than 16 species of underwater grasses. And whereas the Chesapeake Bay is home to more than 17 million people, many of whom rely upon the bay for their livelihood and rec re recreation activities, and whereas an important source of food for the Commonwealth and the East Coast of the United States, the Chesapeake Bay produces more than 500 million pounds of seafood harvest each year. And whereas the rich history, pivotal economic imports, and astounding beauty of the Chesapeake Bay watershed never ceased to amaze residents and visitors alike. And whereas the City of Falls Church is divided into two look watersheds, Trips Run and Four Mile Run, both of which are important to the character and quality of life of the city and ultimately affect the health of the Potomac River and the Chesapeake Bay. And whereas the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments has recognized the importance of Chesapeake Bay Week, Awareness Week, has encouraged its members to do the same. Now, therefore, I, David Tarter, Mayor of the City of Falls Church, Virginia, do hereby proclaim June 3rd through the 11th, 2017, as Chesapeake Bay Awareness Week in the City of Falls Church, and urge all citizens to recognize the importance of this observation and to participate in events, activities, and educational programs designed to increase awareness of the importance of the Chesapeake Bay in our community. Shields, is there anyone to receive this proclamation? Mike, would you like to? Welcome back. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead. I'm going to, not too much fanfare here, but come on up. Uh, we'll, uh... Come on. Come on. Come on. I was looking for you. <laughs> yeah, you're the main man. Well, I don't know. You want to give it to me? You all come fancy on. and badges come and everything I'll else. Have How those vests deal with that? Oh, well. They probably reflect. <laughs> All right. Mr. Mayor? Yes, another and, proclamation? Uh, no. <laughs> through, um, through the efforts of Mr. Z, we are in touch with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and they did let us know that they used our proclamation this year as a template that they sent out, and they would be glad to receive that as well, so I'll make sure that they get this year's proclamation. That is great, thank you, Mr. Z, and I understand, Mr. Z, you're also now chair of the Virginia Municipal League's uh, Environmental Committee for the whole state, is that right? That's correct, uh, thank you very much for that. It, uh, 
gives uh, the city, it gives me, it gives the city a seat on the legislative committee for VML. And uh, so we're looking forward to doing some great things. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next item, which is oaths of office to administer to new boards and commission members. Madam Clerk, has anyone received an oath this morning? This evening? No, sir. Okay. Let's go on to receipt of public comments and start with summary of written comments. Yes, uh, after uh, last uh, regular meeting, we received um, several more comments about the Railroad Avenue Cottage Housing Project. Sarah Tarpgard of 417 Lincoln Avenue wrote in support of the project. Um, Hal Morgan of 907 Hillwood Avenue expressed his concern about the project and also said the developer of Mason Row um, was not um, acting in good faith. Uh, Peter Seitz uh, doesn't believe the project, cottage housing project, is a good fit for the location. He also suggested starting over with the Mason Row project if there is a completely different plan. Pat Gianelli of 1404 Ellison Street opposed the project and ex also expressed concerns about the Mason Row project. Um, Ann O'Neill of 200 Pennsylvania Avenue wrote in support of the project. Um, the Mason Row Founders Project, we had a few um, comments about that. David Thurkle of 1004 Steeples Court was concerned about the project and said um, violation of any of the conditions was grounds for revocation of the special exception. Lisa Varuxis wrote with her concerns and said the developers should meet the commitments that they made. Vipas wrote in opposition to substituting senior housing for a hotel in the project. Linda Nabergall wrote in opposition to the project. Cindy Wackerbarth asked council to decline further consideration of the most recent proposal. And then we received um, concerns uh, about the Broad and Washington project and also uh, some requested developer concessions from Mary Chavis, Diane and Tom Duggan, Ambassador Eric Schultz and Claudia Schultz, Leslie Rye, John Coleman, Genevieve Ordar, Linda and Mokhtar Kamau, and Dennis Zemanski. Okay, thank you very much. So now we're gonna move on to the receipt of public comments. I have one speaker right now. If anyone else wishes to speak, you're certainly welcome to. You need to fill out one of these red speaker slips and hand it to the clerk. We ask that you keep your comments to three minutes and state your name and address for the record. As you'll hear in a moment, the Founders Road Project will not be heard tonight. Um, the developer is not available, um, but uh, you're welcome to speak nonetheless on that matter or any others that you wish to speak to. At the present, again, I just have one speaker I'm gonna call right now, uh, Lorraine O'Rourke. Welcome. Thank you for coming out. Well, I feel special being the only one, but, um, so I came tonight to talk about founders where I was disappointed to see they weren't gonna be here. Um, but I've been watching and I've been looking for um, explanation as to why either Spectrum Development and or Mill Creek has opted to put those planners up at, where they did at 7-Eleven and Mike's Deli. And, and I haven't heard them say anything. I haven't heard them apologize. And it, it appears that they heard loud and clear why there was such a poor idea since they removed those planners so quickly. And I believe that the business owners, the patrons of those businesses, and the citizens of Falls Church deserve an apology and an explanation as to why they put them there. I think uh, they then donating the planners to the school does not absolve them of the poor decision-making skills and bullying practices. Uh, it was simply giving their trash away for someone else to have to deal with, because I'm not sure how useful they are to the schools. I think Spectrum and Mill Creek were acting in bad faith. They put many, many people at risk of injury with that stunt by making a bad parking lot even worse, risking car accidents, bicycle accidents, and pedestrian accidents. I also believe this business tactic and poor decision-making school shows us that this, um, being the citizens of Falls Church, the true nature of these companies, and I'm a true believer in the way a person acts or a company acts in public with employees and during negotiation will show us what kind of citizens that company is and what these companies, um, how they are, and they will treat us just as poorly as they did those businesses. In my opinion, Spectrum Development and Mill Creek have shown us that they will be undesirable citizens and bad neighbors to the citizens of Falls Church. So I'm asking you to deny Spectrum Development and or Mill Creek's variance to the special exception and do not allow them to substitute residential apartments for commercial space. 
is to remember if it acts like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck and not a swan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, is there anyone else who wishes Mr. Clinton? Fire the city clerk shortly. Uh, just a real quick uh, note. Uh, we set record uh, transaction totals uh, last week at the DMV to go, which is the DMV mobile unit which parks out front of City Hall the second Friday of every month. And we also have three dates the second week of every month over the American Legion Hall. And we have a handy list of all the dates, and I believe it's also on our website. But we appreciate people coming out and uh, you know, using the DMV and not going to Tyson's or Arlington where the lines are much longer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, is there anyone else who wishes to speak at this time? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to council requests. Are there any council requests? Mr. Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just three quick things. Uh, first, Mr. Manager and Madam Clerk, for public notice purposes, uh, the Economic Development Committee meeting is scheduled for, is it Friday now at 9.30? Okay. Madam Clerk, I just wanted to make sure that that's what your records show. I will look that up right now. Okay, <laughs> I, thanks. I don't want to commit we, to anything. You know, normally we meet on Thursdays, but we moved it to Friday for reasons that I can't remember, but that's what I we know did. it was moved. I just want to make sure the time's correct. Okay. All right. I think 9.30. Uh, second, uh, the status of the Broad and Washington Insight application, uh, Mr. Manager, I don't know. Uh, I'm to meet with a group of uh, neighbors tomorrow night, and I wanted to be able to report uh, what the status of their application is. Have they submitted a revised application yet or not? They have not submitted their formal revised application. We did meet with the developers on Friday and we received a set of, uh, of conceptual plans that indicates the, the movement that they've made since their application that the council was briefed on at work session. And, um, and so we will uh, we're reviewing those right now. Um, I don't have these digitally, so I haven't been able to distribute those. Um, after this meeting, I'd be happy to uh, walk you through what they've showed us. But there are some, there are changes from the application uh, that was that was uh, submitted, which the council saw at your work session. Um, of some density has moved from Lawton Avenue, um, and and uh, lowered the profile of the building for a portion of the Lawton Avenue uh, facade. There's also been movement on the placemaking, on uh, sort of the access through the site to the parking in the back, and some other changes. Uh, but in terms of the, the largest uh, change to the ma building massing, it is on that uh, Lawton Avenue side. Uh, but before, um, I, I think it's important for people to see the pictures and understand what those changes are um, as, as we go forward. Okay, not to dive into too much more detail, but uh, so if uh, the group that I'm meeting with tomorrow night, you know, wants to know uh, when these materials that you're talking about now uh, would be available for review generally, would, would I say uh, later this week, by the time council hears it next, what's, what's the appropriate answer? The, the next meeting is scheduled for June uh, June 5th, where there will be a public presentation of these changes. And so we will get the information out as quickly as we get it in a form that Insight has said this is now formally what our change is, and we will distribute that. And, um, okay. Uh, the third thing, uh, back during the budget consideration, we talked about uh, uh, efforts that we would try to undertake in the uh, new year uh, to achieve administrative efficiencies uh, between general government and the Falls Church City School System. And uh, I just wanted to remind us all that we had discussed that and to ask if perhaps uh, uh, in early June or sometime in June we might uh, begin a discussion of uh, how we would explore consolidating certain services in areas that uh, made sense to achieve uh, better coordination and perhaps some savings, particularly in human resources and financial management. So I just wanted to bring that up tonight and uh, perhaps get your thoughts at our next meeting about what the timetable for uh, exploring and discussing that might be. Okay, anything else or is that it, Mr. 
Duncan, any other council requests? Looks like we have two. Ms. Oliver, then Mr. Snyder. Um, Mr. Shields and Ms. Mester, could we please follow up with Dominion about the street lights on Annandale Road? Um, the last time you followed up, they fixed half of them, and the other half are still dark. Mr. Snyder. Much. Um, I think we're going to be scheduling, Mr. City Manager, if I'm correct, a session on Metro uh, funding issues in the near future. So I want to make sure we get that on the agenda as soon as we can. Um, second thing, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank all the city staff, the Historical Commission, the Cherry Hill Volunteers, Vipis, particularly Nikki Henderson, Keith Thurston, the reenactors and others, the union reenactors, that is. Um, who um, made our uh, Civil War Day um, a very educational um, experience for all and an opportunity to show off one of the city's primary historic assets, namely the Cherry Hill Farmhouse, as well as to engage in education about the, um, the Civil War era here in the city of Falls Church. So I just wanted to recognize all those folks, including city staff that made that uh, possible. Thank you. And how many years have you been doing that, Mr. Snyder? Not quite 150. <laughs> yeah. But he's still a private. I went by and saw him with his private uniform. So we're going to work on that promotion. Don't worry. Uh, but anyway, it was a great event. Uh, it really is fun every year. So thank you for participating. Uh, Ms. Hardy? We're likely going to get to this um, when we talk about the campus at the end of the meeting. But I figured while we had a bigger audience now, I wanted to make sure we start talking about the communication plan for the June 10th town hall. That'll be the next big kind of public opportunity for us to check in with the public on where we are with the campus project. I think it's June 10th at 9 a.m. at um, MEH. I'd love to see the same level of communication and hence turnout that we had in the February meeting. The, uh, I was planning to speak to that during the manager's report, um, but we will uh, we'll just say we, we have uh, been promoting it on social media, but we're really gonna increase the profile of that. We do have ads that are running in the local paper. We'll have yard signs. Um, and uh, the message board and basically kind of all channels communication uh, and this is for a campus update um, a planning event um, on june 10th at mary ellen henderson middle school it will run from 9 a.m until noon uh, and that's uh, saturday june 10th and um, and as you stated that the purpose is to provide an update for the community on the school feasibility study so we're, we're getting to some, some key um, information that's coming out of the Perkins Eastman work on um, um, identifying the best options for the placement of the school and then working through um, uh, cost estimates for those options. In addition, we'll do a check-in with the community on the small area plan. We'll reflect back what we heard at the meeting that occurred about a month and a half ago um, and get further input on the sort of the overall uh, planning for that site. And um, so again, that's Saturday, June 10th from 9 a.m. till noon. All right, any other council requests? If not, let's move on to the report of the city manager, Mr. Shields. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. Um, I wanted to report on that, uh, on the campus planning effort. A couple of things that I will just note, the campus working group is uh, continuing to meet and working with Perkins Eastman. That's a, uh, a group of city council, school board, and staff that are working together uh, overseeing that study. In addition, the Economic Working Group is meeting on a regular basis of continuing to be uh, reaching out to industry to talk about the potential uh, for uh, commercial development on the site. And the Working Group also uh, oversaw the development of a request for proposals for commercial real estate advisory services. And uh, we issued that RFP in mid-April uh, we got five responses back from very reputable firms. Uh, we had a selection and evaluation process, and the top-ranked uh, respondent uh, met with the Economic Working Group on Friday, um, and that's the, the um, firm of Alvarez and Marsal. And uh, on the uh, council's dais is, a, is an item for council's consideration under other business tonight to allow that contract to proceed for phase one of the work which is really just to get us through the initial evaluation of the site and for work that will take us through the, the bond referendum period. Um, phase one is evaluation study for the site. 
and putting together a strategy, a marketing strategy for the most effective way to take this land ultimately to market if, if, if the bond is approved, how best to take it to market in a way that would maximize the city's value and minimize the city's risk. And, um, and so that action is requested at a later uh, point on tonight's meeting. Uh, those are a, a couple of additional updates on the campus plan. All of this is geared uh, towards uh, trying to provide uh, the information that the council would need to consider an amendment to the capital improvements program uh, to bring in uh, the, the high school project into the CIP and in addition to consider uh, the authorization of a referendum question on the ballot next November 9th um, for the high school project. And those actions are scheduled for the end of July, um, about two and a half months from now. So um, these efforts are, are all geared to help, um, A, provide good public input in that process and provide uh, information and decision support for at least that bond referendum question. Um, in addition to that, under uh, for the manager's report, I just want to note on Monday, May 29th, uh, is Memorial Day, and we will celebrate that day in, in the City of Falls Church, uh, which we do in a, in a way that is um, encompasses the appropriate uh, solemnity of the occasion with our uh, Memorial Day ceremony, which is at the Veterans Memorial Garden here in the city at 11 a.m., and in addition to that, that um, the, the serious um, ceremony, we also have a great deal of uh, fun events planned for the day, including the 9 a.m. Uh, fun run sponsored by Don Byer Volvo, um, and at 2 p.m. the parade. And the parade will be led by our Grand Marshal this, this uh, year, who is Barb Cram. And it's appropriate that we're in Volunteer Appreciation Month because Barb Cram is one of our stalwart volunteers in the city and is being recognized for that um, and many other things as the Grand Marshal of our parade this year. And of course, all day long, we'll have tours of the Cherry Hill Farmhouse, amusements, food, vendors, and live music happening in the city all day. So everyone is welcome and we expect a big crowd. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions for our city manager? If not, let's move on to item on, items on the agenda, which, uh, Looks like I guess the next thing is appointments. Is that right? Madam Clerk, there's nothing on the actual business on the agenda portion. No, just the consent items, which includes appointments. Okay. Why uh, don't we also have the NVTC agreement? Yeah, which is on consent. Yeah. It's on consent. Oh, I'm sorry. The appointments are on consent as well, though. That's right. Correct? Did you want to break that out, Mr. Shields? And the uh, I just wanted to make sure that that was acknowledged. That's on consent as well. Okay, and this is actually what we discussed when we had the work session on bike share, and this is just, just the formality mm. of approving, approving the agreement. Is that correct? Yeah, this is an agreement with the NVTC for the processing of the funding that will come to the city that will ultimately help pay for the operations for bike share. Gotcha, and this is already based on pre-approved and pre-agreed upon uh, funding that we've gotten as grants, et cetera? That is correct. Okay. Um, is there any motion to approve these items? We can remove something from the consent agenda if uh, necessary. Mr. Mayor, I would move approval of both consent items, but I think we should let council make any comments they want about either one. Uh, but if there are no, then I would certainly move approval uh, of both consent items. Well, I've asked the city attorney, can we comment on these items? Is that essentially take it off consent by making comments uh, to a particular item? No, I think if you have statements to make, you can go ahead and make those. All right. Does anyone wish to say anything about either one of these items? Can I second the motion before? Yes, go ahead. I'll second the motion. Okay, it's done. So, Mr. Mayor, on the NVTC, um, it's getting increasingly to be a complicated affair to get any serious transportation funding money, and this was a cooperative effort on the part of... Um, uh, a part of all of us and uh, city staff, so I wholeheartedly support this, and I think it's consistent with the desires of the community. So I would, uh, those were the comments that I'd make on that one. Anyone else uh, wish to say anything about either one of these items? I want to thank you, Mr. Snyder. I know you personally were involved in uh, this grant as well, but I think this is a great win for the city. Bike share is going to be. Um, I think wonderful for our city and being able to finance this through grants for capital and three years of operation is a big win for the taxpayers of our city. So 
Um, anyway, I'm very pleased to support this item. Madam Clerk, I think, unless there's anything else, why don't you go ahead and call a vote. Ms. Conley? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Ms. Oliver? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mr. Z? Yes. Mayor Tarter? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Okay, let's move on to other business. And I know the first item is Mason Rowe, and I understand Mr. Shields, the applicant, um, was unable to be here tonight? Yes, that is correct. We were called uh, this afternoon by the applicant uh, to request that this be rescheduled for another date. They were called out of town for business travel and uh, were not able to attend tonight. Okay. Um, if there's any member of the public who came to speak to this matter, you're more than welcome to speak at this point. We just ask you to fill out a speaker slip, as I mentioned earlier, and, and come forward and you can speak. Um, is there anyone on council that would like to speak to this matter, even though the applicant is not here? Okay. Uh, any member of the public? Looks like none, so we'll go ahead and I guess move on then. Let's move on to the next okay. item. City Hall project update. So, so tonight we wanted to take the opportunity at tonight's meeting to provide the council and the community with an update on the City Hall project. And uh, Cindy Mester, our uh, deputy city manager, and James Mack, our civil engineer and, and project manager, uh, will provide tonight's update. Um, in summary, uh, what we have done is, is work through some elements to simplify the project, um, but still meet the fundamental goals that were laid out in the project charter, which was to improve the safety of our court operations, um, provide a, a secure parking in Sallyport uh, for our police department, improved um, uh, safety for the building as a whole, and move all the public meeting spaces really to the front of the building so that the public can easily get in um, and have their public meetings, uh, which happens um, every night of the week in, on, um, in this building, and also for the public to be able to conduct their business, whether it's to meet with a commissioner or a treasurer or uh, pull a building permit or meet with a clerk of court and put those, uh, those functions right up front in a way that's very easy for the public to navigate and get, uh, get business done here at City Hall. And so those themes are, are still um, being accomplished in the project, but um, in, a, in a simplified manner. So I'll turn it over for the presentation to walk through what those changes look like and, and, um, um, and get the council's feedback on those. Thank you, Wyatt. And uh, I'd like to thank council for yet another opportunity to present this uh, important project. And before I start, I'd like to uh, introduce two of our um, consultants from HIT Contracting who are here. I have uh, Mitch, Mitch Filippowitz, hopefully I didn't butcher that, and then uh, Tyler Wil Wilson. Um, so they're both with HIT Contracting uh, who we brought on in December to provide uh, pre-construction services uh, for our project. And we'll talk a little bit more about their role in a minute. Um, so just to uh, rehash a little bit of what Wyatt said and reintroduce us to the project. Again, this is a public safety and security focused project, um, really built around creating secure access and movement through the building for, you know, various users of this facility, the police, sheriff, judges, court, and the public. And then kind of as an ancillary result or bonus to this project, you know, we're improving the customer experience by centralizing a lot of those um, lobby areas and so when you enter you have easy access to the different city services um, and then of course updating the code uh, the HVAC the electric the plumbing um, and that also saves us on operational costs helps us with our sustainability goals um, and we're uh, reaching for a lead silver as council has um, uh, as 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 is a uh, required by council. So just uh, since last December, uh, when we last were here, we uh, awarded the CMAR construction management at risk contract to HIT um, in December. And then we did a really deep dive into the project that we uh, presented with you all. Uh, and that project, uh, and that deep dive really came uh, with going through the historical pricing that HIT has and then also uh, it had con contacted some of their sub-consultants for quotes and pricing, so we really had an idea of 
what the market was like out there. Um, and that estimate came back at 19.5 million. So it was 6.5 over our $13 million budget. Um, so since after we got that back, we really started to look through the project uh, and start refining it to bring it back within the $13 million budget while still meeting our core project goals. And so now, today, what we want to show is, you know, we've got a project that meets our project goals that we talked about earlier. It meets the current and projected space needs that we did uh, way back with Dewberry when we went and uh, talked with all the departments uh, what our future build-out is going to look like. And more, most importantly, is within the $13 million budget we've got. And so from today moving forward, uh, we're planning to submit for a site plan on um, May 29th, and we'll continue to do public outreach through that site plan process. And what we're trying to accomplish is uh, get to construction in October. And reason behind that is we want to be in before the winter weather, uh, before we uh, have a lot of risks that come with that, before we have to mitigate for that. Um, and that's really a kind of a critical timeline to hit so that we can be within budget. And since we're talking a lot about budget, we'll, uh, re let's revisit the funding and budget for this project. We have about 16.95 million approved through the various CIPs. We spent a million dollars on critical renovations, that's asbestos removal, snow rails, um, police evidence room, uh, and others, other projects around. Uh, City Hall, so we end up with 15.95 to work with. And out of this 15.95, we spent 1.75. This is on our feasibility studies. This is on Dewberry studies. This is on Studio 27's fees. This is on uh, HITS pre-construction fees. So that leaves us with 14.2 million. 1.2 million of that we've put aside for furnishings, furniture, um, commissioning costs, and then costs to move and relocate departments throughout the construction process. So that leaves us with about 13 million for construction. And so before we really get into the, I guess, the renderings or the detail of the design, I just want to go through from a high level uh, the changes that we've made since December. So what you're looking here uh, on the left is the December kind of plan view, a uh, high level look that we presented, and then this on the right is what our current project is. So we've essentially moved from a two additions, which you see in the gold there, uh, a front and a back addition with a garage, to just one addition, which you see on the right-hand side in the gold uh, and a garage. So it's two additions in a garage to one addition in the garage. Um, and just to buy the numbers, drill down, we're still doing uh, interior renovations 42,500 square feet. The additions, those two additions that you saw before were 12,500 square feet. That's going down to a 4,000 square foot addition. And the garage is also a big reduction from 44,000 square feet that went all the way back to the community center being reduced to uh, 11,200. Parking spaces, 44 net new to 13 net new. Um, and then I guess with the cost, before we were 6.5 over budget, now we are in a $13 million budget. Uh, and we have gone out not only using HITS uh, cost estimation, we've also approached independent cost estimators, so we're pretty confident about uh, where our budget numbers are coming from and where the market is right now in terms of cost. Uh, and then this is just, uh, I want to talk through a little bit about the stakeholder comments that we uh, did here. Uh, throughout our whole uh, public outreach and department stakeholder outreach, boards and commissions outreach um, that we did from, I think, July to, no, uh, to December of last year, and we've, we've actually kept going. I've, I've gotten a few comments in since then. Uh, a lot of comments about exterior architecture, security and safety, uh, uh, accessibility and wayfinding. So I think those three things, you know, we've made sure that we cognizant at, we've been cognizant of as we've gone on in the design. Um, uh, we've maximized 
the interior space use, and then we've uh, made sure that we don't preclude any future projects that we've got going on. Um, and then uh, because of this limited impact, we're only doing one expansion in the back, the construction and phasing will be considerably reduced. Um, of course, we are looking at the, I guess we could consider it kind of top of the line or uh, HVAC and, and uh, lighting packages for this. Uh, we are still looking at achieving lead silver. So the current design, again, we're meeting our project goals. Uh, we're maintaining the original program um, and the concept of this open lobby space with effective wayfinding. You're going to come into the central entrance and be able to navigate uh, easily through City Hall. Uh, we're going to maintain these departmental space needs um, and the future space needs. Um, we actually probably have a few more meeting spaces than we do now. Uh, and they're also much more uh, centrally located and convenient for uh, the public coming in. Um, we're maintaining the historic City Hall frontage and aesthetics, so we're no longer putting a front addition to City Hall, so we'll be able to maintain this frontage here. Uh, we're going to keep two public elevators. There was a lot of concern about having that one central elevator in the front that uh, would block views into uh, City Hall, so we're maintaining our existing shafts. We're going to replace or upgrade the existing elevators. Uh, Minimizing impacts to Cherry Hill Park and campus, this will be much smaller, reduced garage, and then minimizing the construction impacts to stakeholders. Again, one addition, one garage, all in the rear, so we won't be impacting um, like farmer's market or other events that, a lot of other events that uh, happen in uh, City Hall that there still will be some construction impacts. Just to go over some of the lead silver sustainability goals that we're uh, trying to achieve, uh, improved energy of performance, so that means lower operating costs. We'll be doing a VRF HVAC system for high efficiency energy recovery, enhanced lighting controls like motion detectors um, and timers to make sure that, you know, like you see in a lot of the modern office buildings now, just the life safety lights stay on after dark um, while all the other lights turn off. Um, we'll be doing third-party commissioning to make sure the systems are installed correctly and running at uh, running the way that they're supposed to be, uh, optimizing the building envelope, uh, environmentally safe refrigerant, reducing our water usage, reducing our heat island effect uh, through we're going to put a terrace on top of the new garage there that can be used for events. It'll also be kind of a green area, green space, um, going on with the concept that were next to Cherry Hill Park. So what are the things that we had to sacrifice to meet this budget? We did have to limit the site work a lot, so we're really limiting the site work to just what's necessary to get this building in uh, and get the uh, garage in. There is a huge reduction in parking uh, from 44 net gain to 13, so instead of this large structure, we're only going to be Instead of a large two-story structure, it'll be a one-story structure in the back. And then uh, these solar options, the electrical vehicle charging, the lead gold, uh, those are outside of the budget. But um, I think some of those, like solar and electrical vehicle, we can definitely uh, make sure we don't preclude them in our final design. And um, I just want to put this back up here just so we're aware of what, what the goals are for this project as a public security, public safety and security focused project. This is the current site plan. Um, and so if you look at the colors here, that middle right there is your existing uh, building. We've got the red up there, which is just uh, redone paver, uh, pavers in the front and kind of clearing out the existing landscaping, keeping George Mason uh, statue there, but we'll be kind of making that area into a plaza area with a, a handicap ADA accessible ramp up the front of the building. Um, and the main entrance will be these existing two entrances right here. Um, so in the back, we'll be doing a one-story addition on top of a secure parking garage. So I think the concept is uh, where we are here in Chambers, this whole area will be gutted 
this will become your central front lobby area. So people will come up these two entrances here into the central front lobby. Uh, what's gonna, the majority of that addition in the back will be a, a courtroom area uh, with a lot of the sheriff's uh, use in the back. And then also that will include a secure elevator that will run from the courtroom level down to the secure parking level. So that, um, so we're maintaining our existing two uh, elevator shafts with new elevators and then we're building a new elevator in the back which is strictly a secure elevator uh, that will do judge transport, inmate transport, um, and police. Um, and this is just a floor plan of this level uh, to show you how, just the, at a conceptual level, how things will work. So people are coming in up the front entrances here into this wide open lobby area. We've got public meeting rooms front and center right there. And then uh, as you go back into the secure vestibule, uh, you'll be able to enter into court. Uh, you've got a secure elevator in the back of court. That'll be for the sheriff and police use. They'll be able to transport uh, the judge up and down, prisoners up and down, uh, that whole back area will kind of be for sheriff use. On either wing, you'll have um, city services and you'll have the existing stairwells that are blown out to be what we call monumental staircases. So um, when you come in, you'll be able to quickly tell, I go half a level up, these are the services. I go half a level down, these are the services. Uh, we plan to put lobby areas at the end of each of these uh, stairwells. So when you come up, you're entering into a lobby area and this is where we'll focus all the counters for all the de various departments ha that have counter services. Those will all be located uh, adjacent to the stairwells essentially. Um, so in addition to that, we've also put some meeting rooms um, that are also adjacent to those counter areas. So when uh, staff is greeting guests or customers, they can bring them immediately right back to an adjacent uh, meeting room to have a meeting without bringing them all the way through staff office areas. Um, that's it. So here's the rendering of how the front will look. As you can see, we're maintaining the existing frontage. Uh, what we'll be doing is putting an ADA ramp in the back there. Um, maintaining the existing two front entrances. Uh, George Mason's statue is in the front there uh, with some landscaping. Um, you know, we can do the landscaping however we, uh, however we want. And then the, uh, the blue colored entrance there, that can also be, that color can be changed and we can do whatever design we like there. Um, but that's really to highlight that for lead, we need to have a certain um, I think it's like an, kind of like an airlock entryway, so we've, we do have to modify the entryway a little bit uh, to meet LEED standards. Um, other than that, from the front of the curb up, that parking lot will essentially remain unchanged. And here's how this uh, existing chambers would look uh, redone into an entry lobby. So if you look um, kind of straight ahead there at the end of that hallway, that's this entrance right here, and you'd be able to enter either our existing elevator or go half a level up, and then you're gonna have service counters right there. Uh, of course, we do all the signage, um, so that is very visible and easy for a customer to navigate. And um, this front lobby area has a lot of potential. We'll, uh, right now, we're showing two um, meeting rooms. We can also use this as a showcase for uh, like local art, um, for city awards, you know, different events, we can showcase that up in this lobby area um, against either the, I guess, the right wall, the south wall right there, or even against some of this glass paneling. This is how the rear addition will look. Again, this is the uh, kind of what I'm calling the courtroom edition, but that also includes a lot of like secure elevator, sheriff and all that. So the rear edition is there on top of this one story garage. Garage is fully secure um, for courts, police, sheriff. On top of that, you've got this uh, green roof terrace kind of concept, and that can be used for a lot of various events. Um, right now we're showing that with some, I think 
farmer's market tents. Um, and, view, and this is the view from the Cherry Hill Park, just, an idea, just to give everyone an idea of how the elevation would look. Um, again, the treatment on the wall, uh, you know, we can do different colors. There's different treatments available for that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the guaranteed maximum price uh, process and how that works. Um, so essentially, the subcontractors are, you know, essentially is acting as our prime contractor. So they will be going out to different subcontractors for bids. These subcontractors will submit bids, will break the work up into smaller packages. These contractors will, subs will submit, pack, submit bids on these packages. HIT will sit down with city staff to review these packages. It's a very transparent process. Um, you know, HIT eventually develops the GMP, but it has, there has to be some basis. So these bids are being used as that basis. Um, so the GMP is all inclusive. That includes all the work plus the CMAR, uh, CMARS fee. And in construction, HIT is the con construction manager uh, and they bear cost overruns. So that does reduce city's risk. And so that's a little different than a traditional bid process, um, but we do feel that due to this, you get better bid pricing. Um, HIT's been involved from, you know, since January, they've been involved essentially from day one on this new design. So they understand the project, they understand the risk, they understand the details, so they'll be able to communicate that to their subs. We'll get better bid pricing. Again, that also leads to reduced change orders. Uh, HIT has vetted certain subcontractors to work with us, so we'll get uh, higher quality tradesmen, higher quality um, subcontractors on this project. And then again, you have all parties are motivated to deliver this project on budget. Uh, the, the exit clause, of course, is that the city can always put this out if we're not happy with the GMP to a traditional uh, bid process. So that really motivates both HIT and city staff to come together and find a way to make a GMP that's favorable to both parties. Um, so talking through how we get to October from here, um, we're in design development right now, uh, and then we're planning to submit uh, for the site plan at the end of May. So through June, we'll be going through the uh, public process, uh, the site plan process. We plan to go through a public town hall uh, in mid-June. And then we hopefully will be doing final construction documents in July, uh, developing the guaranteed maximum price, again, getting bids from subconsultants in August. And then we'll be coming back to council in September for this final approval of the GMP, essentially uh, cons approval of the construction contract. Um, and then that will lead us into beginning of construction in October. Uh, again, October is the date we want to hit to be in before uh, winter. Uh, to minimize our risk on this project. And this is just detail on that timeline, site plan process. We're submitting May 29th. That'll go through the Planning Commission. See some of those members here. Uh, a public hearing will be uh, as part of that process. And then uh, we'll also be going through a public town hall in mid-June uh, with the public comment and boards and commissions. Uh, and then also employ town hall to solicit those comments. Uh, we'll be updating our website and keeping that updated as we go through this process. That's it. Thank you very much. I think let's go with turn off the lights maybe. Uh, so um, do we have any, let's start with questions. Do we have any questions? Okay, uh, Ms. Oliver and then Ms. Hardy. Um, how old is the new, the new design? How long have we had the new design? Like, it's, it's very fresh. It's maybe like less than a month. Less than a month. Yeah, and we, we've, I mean, it, we've gone through a lot of work to try to make this, try to make this work, yeah. So this design's only about a month old, and you're planning to submit it for site plan approval next week because we're working towards an October deadline. So it's a very compressed window here. And, and we have only tonight as council to comment on this and make a decision about whether we're going forward in this October or not. You do in terms of the current design 
scaled back. You've seen the goals before. We will be back to you in September. You will actually have a formal time to act to proceed or not because that's when you approve the dollar construction contract. And has the City Hall Task Force had a chance to look at this? The City Hall Task Force has not. They were invited tonight to get a briefing. And then when we submit the site plan at the end of May, that begins the staff work and will be con you know, so that they can review it against codes. And we're working on the outside of the building envelope and the garage. Internally, we'll still be doing a lot of defining. Concurrently, we'll be working with the task force members, many of which are internal, many of which are on the planning committee. And one last timing question. Uh, we as council had decided that we wanted to take up the CIP after we approved the budget this year. Um, I'm a little bit concerned that we're rushing forward with this project when we haven't had a chance to take a look at the, the entire CIP. And I wanted to check with Mr. Shields about whether we had a scheduled date for starting that. The uh, schedule is for your second work session in June. So on June 5th, you'll get the feasibility study. Then on um, June 19th, we'll consider the, the amendment to the CIP. And June 26th is the scheduled date for first reading on an amendment to the CIP. If we don't hit that date, then uh, July 10th would be your fallback date for first reading on an amendment. So we're in the process of amending the CIP and we're trying to, to move this forward tonight before we have had a chance to consider it within the context of the broader CIP. Ms. Hardy. Thank you. Um, so I certainly appreciate all the efforts to try to keep this in budget, but I share all of Ms. Oliver's concerns. I actually wrote down many of those same questions. I am very concerned about the aggressive schedule and the rushing to try to get this done before we have that broader CIP discussion. When I saw the timeline up there for when we're trying to get site plan, it just seems like we're doing this in a vacuum. I think we can't make a decision on City Hall without the context of all the other capital needs, because as it stands now, we have a very aggressive capital program, and I think it would be unwise for us to say yes to something without knowing how much everything else is going to cost us. Um, I do have a bunch of tactical questions, though, if you'll entertain those. Um, one of the things I heard um, why we're trying to rush through this is to minimize the cost of winter um, pricing, I guess, with construction. My understanding, and I know very little about construction, is that it's mainly concrete work that we're concerned about and the cost to keep concrete warm. Do we roughly know how much that might cost if we don't actually start in October? Does it really make, my point of my question is how much of a big deal is that? Like what if we started in January? How much does that two month change cost? Um, on cost issue, ma'am, I, I, I wouldn't be able to, really pinpoint that there, I'm sorry Mitch Filipowitz hit contracting um, yeah the issues are the cold weather concrete and being in the ground in the dirt in the winter time subject to snow and ice and freezing so those two things we did talk about that before we came up here tonight and if we have a winter like we had last winter we think that the impact would be very minimal but if we have a winter like we had two winters ago, we would expect costs to be in the range of somewhere around $100,000 a month. So it can have a hefty impact on the construction process. And so is that like a, we think, 5% increase in the budget? If we are pouring, I mean, I assume we're pouring concrete over the course of a few weeks, so it shouldn't last months, right? In the context of a $14 million project, I just want to make sure that we're trying to make, we're optimizing for the right thing. We're not optimizing for $100,000 costs and trying to make this decision in a vacuum from all the other capital costs we have. I, I would think that the ground portion of the work may be one quarter of our schedule. So that would be three to four months. So, if we, you know, if it's $100,000 a month, you can do the math on that. Um, it also has impacts on us later in the construction process. If we're delayed three or four months due to weather over the winter, it has an impact on work the following summer and workloads in the current market are very, very busy. Um, some other questions from Mr. Mack and Ms. Mester. Um, based on the, I think it's the original $17 million project, it sounds like I've understood that $4 million has been spent to date. Um, when are the next big draws? on the remaining 13 or $14 million? 
The next big draws, all the, all the money, I was trying to get back to that slide real quick. Close, right? Yep. So um, of the, oh, there it was. Yep. So the first four lines, you have already awarded contracts for those, so those are already expense. The 13 million in September would be your next contractual commitment and then subsequent draw. Um, and we would time the bond issuance to mi minimize the amount of time that's out. And right now staff is considering proposing to you an 18 month reimbursement resolution so that we could start the work and then time it so it goes out with other bond issuance to reduce costs. And then concurrent with that, we'll have to start doing the relocations and the commissioning and then the FE, ff &E to actually outfit the building will come in as the construction proceeds. We're currently looking at a 24 month construction period. So we'd have to, to take out the bond this September before we start construction in October if we stuck with this timeline. Is that, okay. So that's before the November referendum from where we might be asking for the high school project. That's part of my concern. Um, so like I said earlier, I really appreciate the efforts to try to keep this within budget. And I know that one of the big cost savings is not doing a 12,000 foot addition and doing a 4,000 square foot addition. Um, and yet we say that we think it's gonna meet our future gross needs as well. Um, do we just expect not to need that extra 8,000 square foot space? How are we actually accomplishing that? Um, for the renovations, which is the bulk of the 42,000 square feet of the existing building, that is still being built out to add space capacity for a 20 year build out. So that's still the program needs that James mentioned in the Dewberry study. The, lo the lo loss of the um, major square footage was for front. And so instead of doing that in the front, we're taking this space and building in the back. So you still get that central front entrance. What we're losing is two um, extra square footage of space, which were 6,000 square feet floors. So that's where your bulk is. In the back, we were gonna have parking garage, two stories, 12,000 square feet of space. And so it just reduces the overall growth, but within the program needs for 20 years, we're still achieving that. We just have gotten really efficient on the layout, which was able to be happened from schematic design now to where we are in development design. So each time you work it, it gets a little more refined. Um, and we certainly had to be within the budget authority given by council. I, mean, I think one of the concerns we often hear is that we don't build big enough and that we have to go back again in five or 10 years and do it again. And so I wanna make sure that when we are cutting corners here that we are doing it appropriately. We don't, we right size for what we think that the needs are for the future, especially I think, you know, meeting space is one of the things I often hear that we don't have enough of in city hall, especially with the numbers of boards and commissions in their meetings. So I wanna make sure that, you know, we are set there. Um, along the lines of what Mr. Duncan mentioned earlier in the meeting around where we can find efficiency across schools and general government. Um, one idea that's been floated several times now is the possibility of actually incorporating central offices here. Would there be room actually for school offices to be co-located with City Hall? Now with this current design or budget, you would need to add at least 10,000 square feet to this building and we did a rough budget estimate when um, the idea was um, loosely raised and it's an eight to $10 million budget increase. And it would need to be a significant redesign because it probably need to go in the back and so instead of a one story parking structure with a terrace and the chambers, it would be a significant redesign. You said it was eight to 10 million. million. Okay. That is internal staff only estimates with no real working on what the central office would need to be in terms um, of design and adjacencies. So that's a good segue to parking. Um, so one of the things I liked about the last design was um, the extra parking spaces that we would get, get, especially in this kind of middle part of town, especially when we were looking at potential library renovations and the need for kind of parking there and not having to do a separate library garage. Now that we're only getting a net 13 new spaces, do we also have a cost estimate for how much it would cost to do a second story on the garage if we wanted to pursue that? Yes, I think uh, we're working with HIT because we wanted to explore could we do that and what would be the impact on the budget. It would be about a million dollars because you're changing your 
um, construction type. And past that level of expertise, I will pass it to the other three members of the team here because I can't get any more detail. So is adding another floor of the garage one million? Yes, you got to change the construction, ramping, and access to it. So it changes also exca excavation and land disturbance. I, I do want to note on the parking issue, the 13 net new is just around the bu building envelope. It doesn't preclude us in the future um, as a separate project and funded to relook at the rear parking lot for what redesign and efficiencies could happen there. Um, and we do believe from past designs with um, uh, Dewberry and different designs, there's probably at least 20 spaces there, but you'd be looking at a much more traditional grid pattern, not our little islands. Um, and we certainly will still be looking at the shared parking concepts in partnership with commercial buildings around us, which we've talked about in the past. So we have some staff resources to work on that. If I could just follow up to Ms. Hardy's question. Um, when we increased the city hall budget from the original cost, was it not to increase the number of parking spaces? It Wasn't was that both, part of? Yeah, parking was part of it, HVAC was part of it, and the um, additional square footages. That, you know, we started budgeting for this in FY12. That last edition of 5.25 million was FY16. And then since then, you know, that was, Cost and time have um, changed what that could buy. Okay, so, but when we increased the budget, it was to get more parking, and now you've taken the parking away. The, the increased parking was part of the 5.25 million, not the sole part. Um, I think that was it for my questions. I guess overall, again, I, I really do appreciate all the efforts to try to reduce the budget um, and try to keep scope the same but and still meet all the needs. Um, I do remain still very concerned about both the accelerated schedule, the lack of the task force input. Boards and commissions haven't seen this. I just think we're rushing through this and haven't had enough eyes on it. Um, and I am concerned about whether we are cutting the right things and whether we are doing this in a vacuum without the context of the larger CIP. So I do think this probably needs more discussion than just tonight. Thank and, you. And during the site plan, all of the boards and commissions would be involved. The site plan approval does not obligate you to the construction contract, but it will get us the public input and reaction to this design. Mr. Schneider. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So um, it's quite a substantial change over everything that we've seen so far. Uh, we've pretty much been given this since Friday, I guess, was the earliest any of us could have learned much about this. So um, I'm reluctant to suggest any sort of approval on the part of the council without some significant additional exposure um, to the Planning Commission, to uh, the task force and others. Um, I, I, I have some questions about the direction that this has taken. Um, I was not a fan of the, the parking garage um, and the fact that you've reduced it in my view is positive unless we were to do this project in tandem with the library and it really were to be a collective uh, money saver, but I don't see that so far. I also note that the failure to expand, uh, the failure to use the front uh, in what I thought was a very attractive and usable additional space, you then trigger the need to pretty much gut this whole area. So it seems to me that you've gone with a more expensive way to produce a redesigned area here on the first floor than you had originally. And um, while if I worked here, I would like this project. If I were the judge, I would like this project. If I were the citizens, not so much. It seems to me a very large expenditure for not very much that the citizens are gonna see and be served by. So. I have a lot of questions and a lot of reluctance uh, to move forward. And I think we need a whole lot more uh, input uh, before there's any kind of, in my view, any kind of stamp of approval uh, from the council. Thank you. And I would like to confirm that staff is not asking for um, formal action tonight because we do concur that we need more community engagement and site plan concurrence on the design. Um, and I. I do want to note, note that the chief is here if there's any questions on the value of the safety and what we are getting out of this building. 
I neglected to acknowledge her before, and she's kind of hiding behind Mitch, so she is here if there's any specific question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Z. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I guess you're seeing a lot of headwinds here. Maybe the best you hope for would be some sideways movement, but uh, I think the headwinds are fairly substantial. I'm not going to give you any tailwinds here. You're not going to get a warm and fuzzy from me on this. I share the general views of council. Uh, we are surprised um, and not pleasantly so. Um, as others have mentioned that um, when you say in fact that uh, you're trying to uh, save on cost by beginning construction at the beginning of winter season, uh, I've started construction at that period of time. I've got to tell you, it never goes well. If you rely on hope for a dry, warm winter season, you'll never get that. You'll probably get the 10 year flood right then and there. That'll wipe out your 15% contingency. I would like to see at the very least a uh, program crosswalk. Let's talk about, originally there was a requirement for parking and a desire for additional parking. Now you're saying that's gone. Um, how do you arrive at that from a basis other than cost savings? Staff spaces, public meeting spaces, those are all wiped out too. So before you said that was necessary as part of the program to meet a program requirement at some future point in time so that this facility could be built to last to a 20, 30, 40 year standard. And now that's gone. We just have the celebration of volunteers. I don't see the volunteers uh, being overjoyed to having less spaces to meet in. So I need to see that explained as well. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the requirement to wipe out this historic excuse me, space is, um, is going to meet with a lot of resistance from the community. Uh, I'm sure that VIPAS and others are going to ask why we are tearing this out and building a new courtroom. Um, that a wise decision. So there are lots of questions to be answered. Uh, I join my fellow council members up here at being um, uh, unpleasantly surprised, I guess is the right word. Uh, I won't use any stronger language than that. Um, finally, uh, can you remind me what the uh, basis for the CMR is uh, with regard to uh, meeting the cost target? Uh, that is to say, if additional cost reductions are, um, are found by value engineering or other eliminations. Is there some kind of bonus structure that we get some of the savings, they get some of the savings? Can you remind me of that, what that is again? What would be the incentive to, uh, to have a comfortable buffer in uh, matching this to a, some people call it contingency, other people call it management reserve, but whatever it is, it goes to hits pocket. So tell me what that is. Uh, sure. Um, so may you might be referring to something like buyouts. Um, when after the bid process and after the GMP is developed, uh, we can put that to um, the subs to do. Essentially, we buy them out, and any cost savings from that is split between the city and um, and hit. So there is some incentive for the fifty fifty. I have to go back and check the. Actual don't know contract. that offhand. I don't know that offhand. I, I, I find that astounding. Thank you. portion that's 60-40 and there's a portion that's 75-25 and I believe both the bigger numbers are with the Can city. you say that again? One, six, uh, one is 60-40 and the other 75-25. I think with both of those. 60-40, 75-25 to hits advantage? No, it's to the city's, city's advantage. advantage. Okay, thank you. Okay, other comments? Mr. Duncan, Vice Mayor Connolly, either one. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, so several of my questions have been answered. I guess, Ms. Mester, my one question, I, you said you're going to meet with staff next week on this. Yes. Do you know where things are going to go yet with this plan? With this plan, we do have for each floor where staff offices will be. 
um, and who's co-located where and adjacencies. The meeting next um, Wednesday and Thursday all day will be going through each department. Will be to specifically lay out within their designated space where each office is and work go, copy rooms, file rooms, etc. Uh, the as I'm looking at that and I see where we're sitting right now is divided into two areas. I'm assuming the the hallway is two stories, and then behind that is that uh, two different levels with a meeting room and then something above it. And then will the new chamber be a two-story room as well so that it's tall and wide like this yeah this area here where we're sitting now that became the wayfinding is basically the same height and you have meeting rooms and office space at that same level and then if you come in here this new level would be on top of the parking structure and it will have a higher ceiling but it's not as high i think it's 14 feet somewhere around there um, and part of that is um, just cost as to how high you go. We are planning basically for the look and traditional feel of here to be replicated in the new space with new uh, AV and wiring and technical resources so it's a much more efficient building and effective. We are probably looking at two levels because this level here where staff is sitting was added just so we could run cabling and stuff under it and it's actually not big enough to get staff through. So we're looking at some more efficiency. But we are, the pews that we just renovated and are historic, the table from the original city hall, the dais look, a lot of that um, feel we hope to redo in the new chambers. Yeah. And we'll be, we'll be reusing, we plan to be reusing some of this existing pews, dais, table, that stuff over there. And there's obviously floor plates on the east and west wing where we identified where staff will go and as I indicated we've been then fine-tuning office locations. Okay. Um, the, another timing question that is just if with this accelerated time frame that others have questions I'm also a little concerned that you would be having a town hall a public town hall in this in the middle of June which is the same time frame that we're having a public meeting on the high school project and it just gets to be a lot of meetings in June at the end of the school year when people aren't paying that much attention. So if there's a way to do that, like, I mean, they don't pay attention in July or August either. So I don't know if that means you have to bump that till September, but as you're looking at the time frame, I'm taking into account what Ms. Hardy, Ms. Oliver and others have said, let's look at the town hall meeting as something that we would like to have people paying attention at. Yeah, we certainly wouldn't overlap and we strategically strategize that. I have to say, I like this design better than the first design. I think it's simpler. Um, I wish that we had gotten to this design before we had to cut $7 million out of it when it would have cost us that much less to do it to begin with. I think this is a more efficient use of space. Um, but. We are where we are, and we had this conversation a month ago when we talked about the cost of Mount Daniel going up and what's happening in construction right now. So I don't want to delay it further by talking and talking and talking because we know the price is only going to go up more, and we need to have to reduce, reduce the footprint further. So my job, I think, as your representative on the City Hall Task Force is to try to understand what process we're going to use to bring your varied and passionate views about this project into alignment with some timetable that gets it done before, as the vice mayor says, it just costs more and more and more, because the more we talk, the more it costs. Uh, you know, I, I commend you for what I think you've brought back here in that it is responsive to concerns about cost and we see what we get when we spend less money. We get less parking. We don't get central office here. Those are two things that I felt pretty strongly about. Um, but, you know, we're working within some budgetary constraints, and so there's some things that we want that we have to give up. Um, the trade-off uh, from changing the appearance of the front was something that 
you know, a lot of people did not react well to. They didn't like the glass front. It didn't fit, didn't look right. At least that's what I heard. That's what Vipas and other groups, I think, had to say. So the approach that you bring now visually is, you know, the, the least disruptive of the traditional look and therefore meets that sort of test. It does change this space here, but I don't know. To me, this space is hardly sacred. Uh, but, you know, those are just my personal opinions. There, there's some things about this that I don't like. There's some things about it that are, that are better, I think, than we had before. Most significantly, it costs, you know, a, a number that we think we can afford. So my question is, how, how do we get our own personal views um, and input from the boards and commissions and other groups uh, into our heads um, in time to make a decision, maybe we're not going to be able to make it before this winter's construction season, and that's just going to cost us more money, but maybe that's the price we have to pay. And what I understand you to be saying is that we're going to be talking about this during, you know, uh, the rest of May, June, July, August, August. September, and then in September we'd bring together all the input and decide whether we're going to go forward with this thing. If, if that's what you're proposing, I think that I support that um, because that gives ample time. I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the view that people tend to check out, but I, I do want to say right here, right now, that this is not a summer when the citizens, staff, and council members are going to be able to check out. You know, we have got too many important things that need to be done and that if we don't do them will simply cost us more money this is a summer when we are going to have to face up to things that at least I've heard and others have been on council longer than I have, but since I came here five years ago, you know, first meeting I, I recall being told that we were under almost the equivalent of a court order to improve the security and, and safety of this building. And that if we did not act, uh, the, the court was going to mandate certain steps to us. As far as I know, the court up to now has been willing to tolerate our extensive deliberation because we did seem to be moving forward. I just want to be able to convince the court that we're continuing to move forward and then in September uh, we would be able to bring all this input together and make a decision. That portion has not changed and you represented the court and the judge's um, actions to date. James and I will be briefing the judge on Wednesday to provide an update to this design, which we believe still is responsive to their uh, concerns, um, but also will update based on tonight's meeting. Okay, well, I don't have a whole lot uh, to add. I think I support the, what I understand to be the process that you've outlined because it gives the community and those of us up here <laughs> several more additional months to uh, you know, really digest what you've presented. I understand that it is fairly new. Um, and, uh, you know, hear what the community thinks about it and hear what we think about it, what trade-offs we're willing to make. Thank you. Mr. C? Yeah, one last comment. Uh, let me try to bring some context to uh, what Council Member Duncan and others may be thinking here. Though. What, what's really going on here is that uh, unless we voice serious enough cons uh, opinion to um, change the process, they're gonna go ahead and just start the design documents and they'll be done and they'll go and bid the thing and they'll bring this back somewhere in early September and say, here it is, approve it or not, but we've just now spent another $2 million drawing it up. And that's kind of it. So. Those are the choices in front of us. You can talk all you want to about bringing the public and boards and commissions into the process, but that plan shows construction documents and all the planning going to this starting less than 45 days from now. Thank you. Mr. Snyder. Uh, I guess if that's the choice, I, I want to be clear, I don't support this plan the way it is. I think it's not much for $13 million. 
I have always supported moving forward on this for safety purposes, but I have serious misgivings about this plan the way it is. If I have to state that very clearly, uh, I will. And it's not purely on the safety issues. I've supported moving forward on those, but I have serious misgivings about this plan, whether it's really value for our uh, community. Thank you. Ms. Hardy. I guess I wanted to hear clarification if that is the case, whether we are going to start spending money in before September. Because that's the question I heard earlier when the next draw was, wasn't until September. You're spending money that's already under contract for the phase. Yeah, so of the, the money design. that would be spent would be the Studio 27 contract to get, get through um, past the conceptual designs, but to the uh, detailed designs. How much money? Contract amount is, it's, I mean, total is 1.75, um, but remaining the fee, remaining fee is 975,000. So we've already spent a considerable amount of that because we brought it through design development now. Um, so how much more are you anticipating spending between now? I don't know what your schedule is, either September or October. Yeah. I think we've spent everything except for that 1.2 and 13. So how much more would you anticipate spending between now and September or October? Um, basically, we would finish out, as Mr. C indicated, all the design development construction documents to be able to proceed to construction and you to have a GMP to consider under the HIP phase two. So that would be the rest of the money that's the 14.2. So how much money extra are we going to be spending between now and September, October? Do you have a number like if we've spent 800000 the total amount is 1.3, that's another 500 grand between now. 950 because yeah, yeah, another 500. So, so 50,000 with uh, HIT right. and the uh, like 500,000, 450 for Four. Studio 27. So between now and irrespective of what comments we may receive between in the summer, we're going to spend because you, you really can't get it's going to take them a period of months, right, to get to construction drawings. So really, they're going to be tasked with that according to this schedule in the very near future. You know, go out and, and design up this. At the same time, though, we're trying to seek comments from task force, and planning commission, et cetera. How's that going to work? Those comments would be included. So right now we're at the development design phase where we take this stuff and we can do the site plan because of the building envelope and we can start working with the staff to fine tune layouts and the meeting room space. With that, then we would, during the site plan process, still do community engagement because we're not quite at construction documents yet. And so we'll get feedback on meeting room space layouts. Those get incorporated into the final construction documents. So the comments we're getting during the summer from the planning commission, from the task force and the boards and commissions would be incorporated into the final approved site plan and the construction docs. And concurrently, we'd be doing our internal work with our building officials and for all the public safety and permits requirements. So all that in comments would be incorporated before we get um, final GMP and full permits. I if mean, I, I, with all due respect, I mean, it seems to me that the kind of comments that you'd be able to incorporate are move this conference from here, move it there, not, you know, hey, maybe we need to add another floor garage and read redo this wang. I mean, essentially, if you're going to get documents done in the next couple months, I don't think you're going to be able to make major redesign of this project and meet that deadline. There's no money to make major redesigns to this project unless council wants to initiate a budget amendment. The money for City Hall is already approved, and so we have been working with that appropriated dollar amount. What's left for construction is $13 million. But I would just say that this is not the project that I approved. So when you say that you have council approval for this project, I mean, this is, this is the $8 million project to which we added $5 million. This is not the $13 million project. Yeah, I was referring to the dollar amount, not the design, because it is significantly different than what you saw in December. Just to round up my comments, I mean, this feels like a big enough departure as well from the version that we last saw, That, I, and especially since it doesn't go to voter referendum for an amount that's nearly double of what the library is. I think we have to hold ourselves to that much higher of a bar for community engagement, and just getting comments over the summer for fine-tuning design does not feel good enough to me. Um, so I would ask that we actually 
take a look at this differently and not rush through this. I've got one more question um, to add to my list of uh, crosswalk with the programming and explanation of the rationale of these things that we asked for earlier. Um, can you also uh, give us the amount we've spent in redesign? And when we spent those. Thank you. Any, sorry, any estimate of the cost of delay, uh, of the cost of delay? Let, let's say that I said right now, you know, this is, it's not going anywhere. And so we need another year. I mean, I'm concerned that at, at some point we're going to be spending $13 million to, you know, pave the front parking lot. I mean, at some point we have to make a decision to do something. And, and I, I understand that that is the most difficult point. Uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering when we are going to belly up to, to that point and, you know, take the input that we've gotten from the community so far, take our own strongly held views, sit down with staff, uh, and a $13 million budget, which as far as I can tell is a, a little more than anybody, except me maybe, is willing to spend, and do a project. I mean, if we wait until the referendum passes in November, say, Will, will we be able to do that in December? And if so, then how much cost am I adding if I wait another construction? Is there any way to estimate that number? Uh, I, I guess um, just to add to, well, why don't you talk about that cost in construction? I did a study for a, a uh, large organization about that for a 10-year study plan. And uh, one of the things that we studied was the, the rate of increase in construction costs over a five-year period, a 10-year period, and a 15-year period. On average, it was staggering that it was more like 3 to 6% per year that you would spend in inflationary costs for construction, whether that combined with all of your materials and your uh, labor increases and cost of living increases that hits the construction industry on almost every front so that would be kind of a range that you would expect to probably see in cost increases per year okay thank you that's helpful so on a 13 million dollar project given our luck we're talking uh, at least uh, i don't know half a million dollars if we wait another year and a million dollars if we wait a whole year <clears throat> yeah I think you also, um, I mean, it costs about 1.1 million for Studio 27, 1.2 million for them to work about a year. So, I mean, when we're doing this redesign, we'll also have to have their professional input. We'll have to have, it's um, their contractor, they're, they're providing cost estimates that's also not for free. So I think those costs you also have to add into it. Okay, I mean, I'm just trying to, you know, resolve the difference in feeling and perception up here between, you know, I feel rushed, I feel like I haven't seen enough of this, and, you know, a history for this project that goes back, well, Mr. Snyder knows better than anybody, I think at least 10 years now, certainly five years. I mean, I've been here five years. Mr. Z would also, I think, say that he was dealing with this probably in his first term. I don't know. I'm just I'm trying to get an idea when we when we are at the point where we think we're going to know enough to spend money that we seem to be wanting to allocate to this, which is $13 million. Well, one thought uh, I would inject is tonight's intent was a briefing. And we didn't have a work session to do it earlier. So this is a work session briefing for the city council to get everybody informed. There's not a decision requested tonight. This is really to get information out about um, a lot of changes we've had to make. And so we've, we've worked through a process to try to bring you back a project that's within the budget that still meets the mission, you know, the charter, the, the project charter. We are getting good feedback, so that's good, that's positive. Um, I will say this, just, you know, my own experience with this change is my first reaction was uh, 
some shock, and you know, it took me a while to sort of process that. I think that's natural for anybody who sees a, a project that's changed significantly since you saw it last time. Uh, what I would ask is that we continue to work together on this. We do need to bring the task force in, into this process. Um, there are a lot of individual questions that I think we can answer. Um, there is more public meeting space in this project um, than there was before. Um, there, but there are obviously things that we're missing. And I think, you know, obviously, substantively, the biggest change is this room, which is a lot of people have different opinions about it, but it, you know, this is an important room. And so it becomes in a corridor and we build a new room, which is the civic heart of, of the city. That's a big, substantial change. It has an emotional context to it as well as a practical context to it. And so it takes a little time to work that through, understand it, see if it's going to fit right. We would propose that the site plan is a good way to do that. We understand the concern about really spending a whole lot of money on uh, detailed designs if there's still some questions about that fundamental issue. Um, but we can still engage on that fundamental issue. Uh, we don't need a resolution of that tonight. But we have gotten, you know, we've gotten some headwinds and some questions that we'll need to respond to. What we would ask is let us continue to engage with you um, to, to see if we can make progress on that. Well, thank you for that. I, uh, uh, I think you've summed up the, um, the initial reaction very well. Um, you had your own moment. Um, hopefully, it's in the privacy of your own office, so any screaming and yelling that you did was heard only by your immediate staff. <laughs> so we're not about to yell at you here. But I, you know, I think what's different here is that we're not under, uh, there's no gun to our head uh, like there was with the Grudley contract in Mount Daniel. There we had a, a done deal, and, uh, and it, the, con the contract was constructed in such a way that Grundley was held to, and is still being held to, having a very small percentage of work that they could actually physically do. So they, there was no way they could take over any of the subcontracts and do any of that work. Um, and I recall um, you know, going through these discussions and, and the information that was out in the public, we had an independent cost estimate, and, and really, uh, to Council Member Duncan's question. Uh, you know, let it be said again that the cost increase is not that dire three, four, five and a half percent increase that's being portrayed here, is being portrayed by a CMAR that stands to benefit from a decrease of any aspect of this project. Um, and we know that to be true because whether uh, the project manager for the city remembers or not, um, Hit construction remembers very well what the percentages are, and I'm glad they remember. Um, so we have some time to figure this out, I think. And it's going to be considerably less than the 4.5% that uh, we've been told. So uh, I think the thing is, I've built major construction. I know how that gets done. So it's been a while. I don't think that we have to be in such a big hurry to just uh, run, run down this track and leave all the citizens behind. I, you know, if Council Member Duncan wants to write a check tomorrow, he's more than welcome to do that. And I'm not going to countersign it for him. All right, um, you guys figured out who goes first. Um, so to clarify, like I'm actually kind of agnostic about the design, uh, other than I think the parking garage, which I think is kind of a missed opportunity to kind of add more parking spaces to the heart of the, the civic center of the city, where I think long term we may actually need more spaces. I actually don't have strong preferences for whether we keep this or not, but it does have the appearance that we're spending $13 million to build ourselves in new chambers. I know there's obviously more work beyond that, but to the public, that's going to be the brand new space. And I think that um, is something that we need to talk about how to communicate better. My concern really is just the schedule and the timing. And so the original plan did not have us starting so aggressively, did not have us having starting site plan in May um, before we're actually talking about rejiggering the CIP potentially when we actually get the George Mason High School cost estimates. It doesn't actually have us breaking ground and starting construction before the referendum. So again, that also has the appearance that we're trying to just cram this in before we make a bunch of other cost decisions. So I want to make sure that we are doing this in the context of all the other capital costs we have. It's less about the design for me and it's more about the process and the community engagement and making sure that we are doing this in a way that we are looking at the full picture of what the city's finances are and not making one-off vacuum decisions. I just wanted to say that, Mr. Shields, you have made the point a number of times that staff is not asking us to make a decision. 
but I'm hearing among my colleagues concerns about the path that you're preparing to rush down. So you're not asking us to make a decision, but I think we need to ask ourselves, do we want to put the brakes on or not? And I understand that staff does not want us to put the brakes on, but I'm very concerned that we are rushing this without the CIP, which we already said we were going to redo this summer. We're going to, we wanted to take another look at the CIP, not only when we had more school information, but also to balance all of the school information against all of the projects in the CIP. That's what we said we had to do because of how heavy the lift was. And now it feels like you're trying to push this through, and I'm, I'm really concerned about it. I would like to stop this until we have taken a look at the entire CIP. That's my personal position. I don't think we should go forward without having looked at that context, because I think that we all know we have a heavy lift coming up. And if we need to tweak this a little bit more, you know, if, if I said to you, you have to do the public safety stuff, you've got eight million, that's all we've got. Um, you know, yes, we'd have to redesign it, yes, there'd be more work. That's conceivably a decision that we could make. You know, when we had agreed to the additional funding, it was to get more. Now, if we're in a cost-constrained environment and we don't have the ability to add a little bit of money and get more, maybe we don't want to add any extras to this. And I just think it's just, um, you know, we have to look at the whole CIP here. Mr. Snyder, did you have something else you want to say? Yeah, just, just um, very quickly and in, in strong agreement with the other members of council. I, when you add this project of 13 million, not 8 million, but 13 million, plus the potential library at eight, plus even a school at 85, you're well over 100 million. I, I don't know how that is, unless we're very careful how we phase it and how we do other things. I don't see how that's sustainable, even assuming a lot of commercial activity, which I'm sure we would all support. So this is where the larger context becomes very relevant. More specifically on this project, what's not clear to me is we seem to have spent an awful lot of money by making even more significant internal renovations. Um, and we've taken off the addition in the front, and in, which immediately triggers then pretty much gutting this entire floor. Now we have two elevators. So I don't understand the internal workings about what costs more, what costs less, what were the trade-offs. To me, it seems like, again, we're spending an awful lot of money and not getting much for public usability. And then finally, on the parking garage, I, I am not a fan of the original parking garage um, approach. I think it was, would have been a blight uh, on this area, but if you need parking, you need parking. But I would not do it just to also do parking on the library. And this is where uh, a, a coordination, not only the financing, but of these projects needs to happen. On the other hand, I'm entirely sensitive to the urgent safety issues, and I, I would like to see a proposal that uh, potentially addresses just those um, for consideration right now. Um, so thank you. Let me ask a question. I know we're making sort of broad comments, but um, so the idea of we're just doing a one-story garage, right? We're not getting any structured parking above. So essentially, we're just securing a parking area, correct? What does that garage cost approximately? Parking garage right now portion is about uh, 1.4 million of that. So million. I guess to my mind, if we're trying to make it secure so people can't come in, I don't know why we can't just put a real nice wall or fence around it. I mean, it doesn't cover the roof, and I guess theoretically somebody could jump a fence or whatever, but just seems to me we ought to be thinking about things like we're not adding parking. Before it was a structured parking where we had two levels of parking. I get why you need to build a structure for that. I'm not sure why you have to build a $1.4 million structure if you could put a wall in or some other security features that keep people out. I'm sure they could helicopter in, but in terms of the majority of people who might want to enter, it seems to me we might be able to take care of that short of a full enclosed structured garage. 
Uh, to that question, I'd like to ask Chief Gavin to respond both for the security and the um, function of this building and then specifically to the parking point you raised. Um, fundamentally, when I first saw this just a couple, uh, like two weeks ago, um, my first reaction was it's less, but sometimes less is more. Um, the fundamental systems in this building um, don't work are woefully um, inadequate in terms of security, wayfinding, ADA. Um, this isn't um, the end all be all in terms of design, but it does meet um, what the finances do um, require, but it also meets what the public safety systems need. We need a secure, divided access, um, pathfinding for citizens and employees and for those people that come in and out of the courtroom, the living courtroom, um, also counsel, it needs to be secure. So when I, when I saw this initially and I saw that there was a council, a new council room and courtroom, um, I was very pleased. The fact that there is covered, secured parking is much more than just parking. That causes a whole system for us to be able to move people and move people safely. May they be special um, judges or dangerous prisoners and or officers coming in and out of the, of the station with very dangerous equipment. We have all kinds of hazardous materials in this building that are housed in this building inside with employees. This allows at least some space, airspace out there that's secure, um, that is um, secluded um, and somewhat um, locked behind, you know, a wall or closed doors. You're right. The parking garage is not the end-all be-all for parking, but it is. It, it's part of a system that defines a public safety area um, for anything that's sensitive, uh, for any equipment that may be needed to be secured, um, and any hazard, hazardous, hazardous material that we currently do have in this building uh, amongst our employees. So that was part of the task force when we talked about it, and we talked long and hard about the garage. Um, the, the garage here would be different. It would be smaller. Uh, the parking practices would be uh, tandem rather than individual spaces. So does it, li it lends to um, what Ms. Connolly was saying in terms of efficiencies. Um, it also divides the prisoner chute from the judge's chute. It divides the, uh, the prisoners coming into this building into to hold up. Um, so it does a lot of dividing in terms of pathway. When you have people in, this, in the city that come in for, for services, they go through this building any which way, all floors. They, they just walk through doors and they walk in somebody's office. What this actually does, it gives you divided pathways for security for your employees, for your citizens, and it puts them in the right path, easy paths, uh, wayfinding paths. When I talk about less is more, in this building right now, you have 10 entry and exits to get in this building. In this model, you maybe have two or three. If you think of any one of your schools in any community, we all know you all go through the front office door because you can't get in any other door. Most government buildings are the same way, not this one. You have 10 doors that you can go into. You have 36 windows on the ground floor. Um, it's woefully insecure. What that garage does is it fortifies half the bent end of your building. It sets up pathways. It gives you much more than parking. Um, but to your point, we do need more parking, right? Um, but I too, when I saw this first, I was really very pleased with the fact that we can fortify a courtroom for your judges, for your counsel, and uh, start with tradition. You, you build it to what you want it to be. Um, but fundamentally, I saw this as a win. It was efficient, it met the financial needs, and uh, I know there's a lot of competition between safety and security space and tradition, but I think this, this actually met 
most of the needs immediately. So. Okay, other comments? I think what you're hearing from up here is that to maybe slow things down some, at least particularly the spending of, of money and not full speed ahead. I mean, I don't know if people feel differently about that, but that's what I'm hearing from most folks up here. And that may ultimately impact the schedule for this, but I think that's a pretty clear message that you're hearing from the majority of council right now. And I think people would like more public input, both from interested parties like the task force and planning commission, but I think probably from the general public as well. And I think from council, uh, this is the first time most folks up here have seen this major revision to this process and this project. And so I think people need more time to absorb it and to really contemplate what's being proposed here and the cost. And I imagine some may not feel that way, but I think most people up here probably do. So may I ask, when is the task force scheduled to meet next? We're actually meeting with um, development services staff and we were going to lay out the site plan schedule that would work for them and then um, within that would have the task force meeting and so we actually hadn't set a date because we wanted to come to council this evening and then next week we would be setting those dates. Okay, so I, I don't know. Yes, yeah, I, I appreciate the mayor's. Soon, but I don't have a date scheduled. Okay, I appreciate the mayor's <laughs> carving at least one of us out from a desire to go slower. I mean, I'm, it's hard for me to imagine how we could take any longer to do this, but I'm continually surprised at how we are able to take more time. Um, and that's fine. That's what people want to do. But I'm just, as a member of the task force, wondering, you know, what what speed would be seen as and what uh, deliberation would be seen as and, and try to choose a date for the task force that would, you know, find a uh, happy place that would be closer to deliberate than to speed. Given that where we are in May and needing to get um, the final uh, designs for the task force and the staff input next week, I think it would have to be after Memorial Day, the beginning of June as soon as that we could get all the task force members together with a good agenda with the staff input on the design layout. Okay, any other comments from up here? Ms. Connolly, Vice Mayor Connolly. So, Ms. Mester, suppose that we look at the capital improvements plan in June and we say, well, we really do want this city hall project, but we can only give $8 million for this. We need you to put that other $5 million someplace else. Then what happens? I mean. I was just confirming. That basically leaves you the $8 million that we're doing for renovation, and you wouldn't have the parking structure, and you wouldn't have the central wayfinding and the core public safety pieces. The renovations that are in this proposal before you is the same that's in the previous design. So that would be your new HVAC, your plumbing, your um, sprinklers for the building, and making staff more efficient and creating office space and some meeting rooms. If you don't do that, um, then you would maybe do new construction of a parking structure, but you're not going to have the HVAC, the plumbing, and the life safety. So we'd have stuff. to make some kind of trade-off decision of what it is that we want to go forward with for public safety and wayfinding and what it is that we think, well, we're going to hold off on this part. Yeah, and when we did this um, analysis before, and we can bring that back out, we went through the whole project and broke out what was public safety. Public safety is broad because it is not just your police department right. and this room when it's as court. It's the safety of the public in this building. Everything was public safety except for HVAC, if you don't want to do HVAC under public safety and the second story of the parking structure. And we showed that to you, that analysis I think was last September of October because it was before the final design in December. You'd have to prioritize which public safety things you wish to do um, in response to the points that the chief just laid out. Yeah, but uh, let me just again reiterate, uh, and I would also like to have a schedule since we're talking schedules of the answer to some of the questions that we asked here, because when you say that you, <clears throat> you threw in the uh, 
enhanced HVAC and uh, I don't know what else, networking services and, and electrical, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that presumes that what you have now um, after some renovation would last forever. We know it doesn't. We know that, that what we have now is failing. And, and uh, you know, the last thing we want is for us or some future council is to have you come back and three years after you do a $8 million renovation say, oh, system died and we could have done this. So, you know, we're not talking about little building blocks here. All this stuff is tied together. Very integrated. <clears throat> but I think the, the larger question we have here is, is, is when you said you need a, a facility that addresses certain programmatic functions based on staff, based on public needs, and now it's gone because of some perceived limitation of what you think we're willing to accept or not accept uh, in terms of larger CIP discussion. I mean, we could very well say, okay, we definitely want a larger parking structure. We definitely want certain other things. And to, in order to get that, given the realities of where we are, these things need to be pushed off in the future. That's just a discussion for council. I mean, that's what we're asking you to bring to us as quickly as you can so that we can have that kind of discussion. Don't need you to break it down in terms of dollars and we remember kind of what it is. Just tell me what you're sacrificing and why. How did you make those decisions to begin with on the program? And how did you now take those things and remove them? That's kind of a simple question. It's the crosswalk that you've yeah. you know. And we can do the crosswalk. I will say that we did not take away any of the programming for the 20 year space build out. So we have built that into the design and we have added meeting rooms and the ability to reconfigure some of the space when we got this wide high area. Um, the, the big reduction would be seen in the physical number of parking associated with this project, but all the points that are on the screen here are being achieved. And to your point about if we don't do X, we'll probably see Y, and we, we have that analysis because we know the HVAC will fail and within five years based on our recent analysis. So at minimum, you'd have a $500,000 bill estimate to fix the current structure and that is not removing some of the life, ha ha life safety hazards that we have in the West Wing with the 1957 asbestos. All right, let's try to wrap up this conversation here pretty soon. Mr. Snyder. So Mr. Mayor, let, let, let me tell you how to best use the time from my perspective. So I kind of divide this project into want to haves and need to have. So with each uh, issue, the want to have, I want to know why, and I want to know what the options are to provide that functionality. With regard to need to have, the same basic question, why, and what are the options for providing that essential functionality? My father was a federal judge, so I am very concerned with the safety of the judiciary and public safety. It's number one for me. But I also realize that there are various ways to provide it at various expense levels. So what I need to know more about this is what were the trade-offs you made? Why did you decide to do what you did? And fundamentally, what in this do we want to have? What do we need to have? Why? And what are the various options for providing it in terms of cost? That would be very helpful for me and I think the citizens. Thanks. And I think we can certainly do that in the program crosswalk and then we just need to figure out in addition to the other public engagement of the task force when possibly we can come back to council for a deeper dive into the layout and the functionality of the current design. I think this also would be good to come back at a work session where we could spend some more time even though we spent a pretty good amount of time on it already but a work session to be able to spend more time with it. It really feels rushed probably to a lot of people up here. Um, so anyway, I think that's about all we have to say at this point. Hopefully that's sufficient guidance for at least the immediate future. All right, thank you very much. I know it's probably very frustrating to come here, but uh, we know this is important, particularly given our fiscal pressures we're going to be facing over the coming uh, years. Thank you all. Thank you for your time, Council. Let's move now. Is there any business not on the agenda? Okay. Any standing committee or regional committee? Uh, we, we do have business. Uh, the other business is the... Uh, oh, the campus project, and we already did. Right. We did that earlier. I thought we did that earlier. Uh, you, sure. Excuse me. Do you want to continue us after 10 p.m.? Mr. Mayor, I move we continue the meeting past 10 p.m. Not sure we're going to have a second on that. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'll second. All right. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Abstentions? We have an enthusiastic eye for that. Um, all right, let's go ahead. Let's crank through this. So we, could, right. we could back the meeting up and put this back on consent. Um, the, uh, the, so what's before council is a, is a request to grant authorization for the city manager to, to um, execute on behalf of the city a contract for the firm of Alvarez and Marcel uh, for uh, commercial real estate services. And um, we've been uh, working really over the last two, just to back up, um, the economic working group oversaw the, the development of a request for proposals for commercial real estate advisory services. And we've broken it into, into three phases of work. Uh, phase one is work that had happened before a referendum. And so that's really planning work. Um, a, give us a solid valuation that we can hang our hat on for what it is we own on the campus. And to do that with a discussion first of highest and best use, but then there was some iterative processes with the economic working group where we say, you know, if we wanted to capture some community values here that might not be highest and best use from a commercial perspective, but meet needs that we have for the city, let's have a, a work through of what that means for value. So that's really what the valuation study piece of it is. In addition uh, to lay the framework for the most efficient and the most effective way to take the land to market, to maximize the city's value and minimize our risk. And there's, that's a multi-step strategy that we really need to plot out. We need to do that also in an iterative fashion with the economic working group and ultimately with the city council and school board signing on to, to address these questions about how prescriptive should the zoning be before we take it to market? Um, what's the best way to get market interest in the site? How best to market it um, um, prior to putting out an RFP? Should it be a two-step process with an RFI before an RFP? All those types of, of issues. So those two things uh, we want before um, the valuation we want before the council takes an action on amending the CIP and approving the referendum question and also have a first draft of that strategic roadmap. The strategic roadmap then would be finished up at a detailed level by, the, by Labor Day, and then both those documents can be used in the public process for the referendum. That's phase one. Uh, the uh, estimated cost for that is $56,000. That's really what the request is tonight uh, is for approval. Uh, phases two and three. Phases two is really the, phase two is really the, probably the most important um, meaty part of the contract. That's where they'd actually be developing the RFP with us and then marketing the property with us, um, um, putting the RFP out, evaluating the proposals, advising us on the selection process, and ultimately advising us on the negotiation of a, uh, an agreement with a master developer for the site. And then phase three is post-agreement phase if issues pop up during development, uh, uh, they would be there to advise us on renegotiating terms. We, uh, ideally, that won't happen, but it, they would be on retainer in the case that we did need those services. So that's the uh, broad idea of the contract. What the request is tonight is um, to proceed with that contract um, and have an authorization for an expenditure of funds through phase one. And the reason it's broken out that way is um, we would lock in the rate sheet and the cost structure for phase two, um, but we have a referendum we would need to get through before we would engage in phase two, and so that could be subject to a, a separate authorization down the road. Mr. Snyder. Thanks a lot, Mr. Mayor. Um, I can put a motion on the table if you want. Uh, I move to uh, approve just to get the discussion going. Move to approve, Mr. City Attorney. What? Uh, move to uh, authorize the City Manager to execute on behalf of the City a contract for services under RFP 0419171 CREAS for commercial and real estate advisory services to Alvarez and. Marshall under the terms set forth in the RFP with expenditures not to exceed 56,408. Okay, do we have a second? Second. All right, before we take a vote, let's uh, find out if there's any comments or questions. Mr. Mayor, I do have a couple questions. One of the things that came up during our uh, 
Economic Development Working Group was whether this firm is at, what is its record in actually bringing projects to fruition. That is, the project actually moves through the planning stage to it's actually built. So can you explain what the, the track record of this firm is on that? Uh, we've been checking references and having just that conversation. And um, they do have clients that have gone all the way through the process. And we've spoken with those clients. And um, they're either in the, in the build phase right now or the project is completed. And we receive pros uh, positive uh, reviews for that process. So some of those clients include uh, Travis County, uh, Howard University, um, Fairfax County, um, uh, the town of Herndon. So in, in all those cases, the project, the commercial project was actually built? Um, no, not all of those cases, um, but we did identify cases where that was the case. Um, we also had discussions with them about projects that are ongoing right now, but uh, we did identify projects that have gone all the way through that development. And are you satisfied they have the capability and like, uh, you can't predict the future, but they have the capability to assist us in a way that will actually bring about commercial development? Um, the, uh, I do. And um, some of the examples in, in their proposal and in the, the people that we've discussed one of the real questions was we, we did feel very solid about, you know, through our discussions with them about the quality of their advice and their experience in the market. Um, some of the questions that we pursued after the work with the Economic Working Group was about the marketing piece and the ability to sort of create market interest in a particular um, uh, site. Um, found examples of that that we felt felt uh, were good examples that that interest was generated and, and had very strong responses from the market. And um, so we approached those questions with skepticism and with an open mind to really try to really try to probe on those and um, and found uh, positive examples. Okay, one other question. Uh, um, members of the working group felt it was very important that the principals that we actually spoke with are the ones that will be directly involved with us as leads on the project? Do we have assurances of that? Uh, we do, and we'll have that written into the, into the contract so that those understandings are also formalized. So one other question. So here, speaking for myself, I don't, I don't want another set of, like, you should make this decision here and you should make it here. What I really want is good information about commercial development prospects for the voters to be looking at when they have to make a decision as early as November. So how much of phase two are we going to have or how much, how much really useful information are we going to be able to generate? Roadmaps are all very interesting, but what discrete products are we going to have to assist the voters to make a decision? And if we go with a referendum in November. Well, those two deliverables would be the, the two discrete items that we would have. One, we would have a valuation report, um, which will have highest and best use value, and then a discussion about impacts on value to accomplish other public policy goals or other um, priorities for the city. Um, we will have that broken down in a manner so that it can be used in the future for actual negotiations with the master developers so that things are broken down on an FAR foot basis or on a basis that they can be used for different development programs. Uh, so that's one discrete deliverable. And then the second is um, that, uh, that marketing strategy so that we can lay out for the voters, here are the steps that we're going to take to bring a master developer into this. And it's important, I think, for the voters to have a good sense as to what's that process going to look like, where are the points where the community gets to shape what that development looks like, where are the points where that's going to be uh, more market driven. And we'll think through all of that strategy over the July and August time frame so that that's a document that's public and that people can use as a reference as we're considering the referendum. So one other, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, just one other question, then, then, then I, I won't ask any more, I promise. Um, what, um, 
So this firm has long-standing contacts with the development community. To, to what extent are they going to be sort of truth testing what they're what they're doing and the information they're giving us as they go along? When are will they be truth testing? Will they be as they go along making recommendations to us? How do we know it's not just pure right. theory as opposed to what what will actually help something get built? There, um, there are different ways that we can do that. And one, we can do a multi-phase RFP so that we get market feedback and um, at, a, um, at earlier stages in the process. An RFP is a very expensive thing to respond to. So we can put out an RFQ, an RFI, or have a two-phased RFP, which we've used in the past. But the idea is to cast a wide net so that people can participate in the process and give us their best ideas on how the property could be developed and with some values atto attached to it. So those would be some earlier ways, so it's not just an academic exercise, but a market-tested exercise. We could do that pre-referendum, um, but uh, and, and we can have that discussion. Currently in the, in the phases that have been laid out, the idea is we would do that, that work post-referendum. But, but nothing we're doing tonight precludes that. Um, that's correct. I mean, we could, uh, we could discuss whether we want to try to do that pre-referendum. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Hardy? I just had one question. Um, I saw that we got five responses for um, commercial real estate advisors. One thing that I did hear on Friday's economic working group meeting was that this firm seemed unique in that they really represent civic interests and they don't really have a dog in the fight later on, so they're not involved in the brokerage later on. Were there any other firms that were similar in that characteristic? Well, we cast the RFPs to request that the, that the, the cost structure be on a fee basis as opposed to on a brokerage or a success fee basis. And uh, the reason for that is as a public entity, um, we have values that might not be purely market driven. And so um, uh, we might be, some, you know, for a private sector where the motive is simple. We want to maximize the profit and that's it. Um, those are where you more commonly would see the brokerage structure. Uh, public sector uses brokerage as well, uh, but we, we, in discussion with the Economic Working Group, didn't want to be in that position. So Alvarez and, and Marcel, their specialty is public sector clients. Now they have a lot of private sector experience, um, but their client base is the public side. Uh, Vice Mayor Connolly, then Mr. Z. Mr. Shields, with these different phases, suppose we get to the end of phase one and the referendum passes, but we don't like what they've done for us. Are we able to negate yes. the contract? So We're not the, locked the, in for three phases. The RFP was structured and the contract uh, will be structured so that there's severability between the phases. Thank you, Mayor. Um, there are others on council here that have uh, been more intimately involved in the CREAS process, and that's fine, but uh, like the public, this is the first time I've been exposed to this. Uh, I see here that uh, Alvarez uh, Marcel, Alvarez Marcel team, uh, has had a major client in the FBI that's um, looking at uh, attracting one developer projects in different locations. I, I think that uh, the fact that they mentioned this along with uh, their teaming uh, uh, speaks well for this organization. Um, also see that they have um, teamed up with uh, Bowen Smart, uh, who is uh, well known to the city here. And so in that regard, when they talk about that they've actually been involved in Falls Church for 10 years and eight years advising Fairfax County, that they really talk about Bowling Smart, not Alvarez, et cetera, right? Um, Alvarez uh, has worked directly with Fairfax County, but not directly with us. In the, but not directly with us in the past. No, that is correct. That would be Bowling Smart. Okay. So, what what is uh, your understanding of the the teaming arrangement between uh, Alvarez and company and Bowling Smart? Is there a, break, uh, a separation of functions? There. Um 
Um, uh, Bolin Smart will be providing, I think, some background context. The team that we met uh, is the team that we'll be working with most directly, and they're, uh, they work for Alvarez and Marcel. So I think that's going to be the, the majority of our engagement with this firm. We'll be with Alvarez and Marcel. And when they talk about, uh, uh, and you spoke about this as well, that uh, uh, they, they have a broad history of serving public interests, uh, public entities uh, uh, with uh, knowledge of uh, how the private industry works. They talk about serving the Secretary of Defense uh, and the U.S. Navy for quite a while. Uh, uh, can you characterize briefly uh, what that kind of experience uh, was about? Um. I need to get back with you on that. I did not, in my reference checks, I did not call the U.S. Navy or, or uh, the, that specific client. So, um, would you like the phone number for the undersecretary? <laughs> uh, but I can, I can follow up. I mean, we're, right. we, uh, I think all these conversations that have actually been very interesting and useful uh, as we've checked the references on this and, and uh, the other firms as well. Well, I asked the question uh, not to not to be funny about this, but only because it it, it seems to me that. The strength of any relationship would be their understanding of what a public sector uh, um, uh, interest, uh, where, where that lies, uh, who their constituencies are, and more importantly, whether they're able to navigate um, both the public and private sector interests. So, uh, and having a client in long-standing relationship like the uh, Secretary of Defense or U.S. Navy would be uh, important knowledge for us. Thank you. Okay, is there any more comment? Um, if not, I guess we have a motion on the table, correct? Uh, Madam Clerk, why don't you call the, the vote here? We, did we have a second? Yes. yes. Okay, is there any member of the public that wishes to speak to this matter? Seeing none, the matter is closed to the public. Uh, Madam Clerk? Ms. Conley? Yes. Mr. Duncan? Yes. Ms. Hardy? Yes. Ms. Oliver? Yes. Mr. Snyder? Yes. Mr. Z? Yes. Mayor Tarter? Yes. Thank you, Council. Uh, passes 7 to 0. Okay. Are we still on the campus project update? Is there any more updating to be done? Um, no. The uh, mentioned some during the manager's report, so I think I'll stop there, but happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Okay, let's keep moving. Is there any business not on the agenda? Okay, are there any standing regional committees or council liaison reports? Mr. Z? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, as uh, was previously re uh, reported, um, the uh, chair of the Virginia Municipal League uh, has uh, stepped down and being the vice chair, uh, VML asked me to step up and be the incoming chairman. Um, this gives us a seat on the legislative committee that it's uh, um, roughly eight members. Um, and so we would have a board rep influence into uh, how Richmond does its business. VML represents towns, cities, and districts uh, in the state of Virginia. Um, it does not represent counties. That would be represented by VACO. So between the two of us, that would be a, a major important thing, uh, uh, a way to, to address some of the issues I think environmental quality is uh, important to uh, me personally, obviously, but I think to all of us here and as it uh, affects how we uh, uh, address our relationship with the, uh, both the natural and built environment. Uh, the other thing is that um, um, COG has uh, uh, asked me to be on a small team uh, to attend a three-day workshop in uh, Denver, Colorado at the end of June uh, to study resiliency and um, so uh, I guess uh, I guess I'm going there it's not the same as going to Turkey but I think I'd rather go to Denver than Turkey any day of the week thank you congratulations we appreciate uh, representation for the city so that's a that's a wonderful uh, opportunity any other council liaison or committee reports all right, let's keep moving then. How about council member comments? Any council member comments? All right, let's move on to the minutes. Minutes of February 13th, uh, 2107. Um, any, uh, any comments, corrections to those? Mr. Mayor. Yes. Madam Clerk. Line 124. 
Staff is working on an after action report. Line 201, projects might be possible. And line 325, the project size was too high, T-O-O. -O. And with those amendments, Mr. Mayor, I move approval of the minutes as corrected. All right, we have a motion by the professor. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions, the ayes have it. All right. Um, is there anything else? We don't have a closed session for this evening. Okay. Anything else to be said tonight before we head on our merry way? May I move to adjourn? Sounds like a plan. Do we have a second? Somebody all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, we are adjourned. <laughs>